Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 763. That is 763 of the Agostino Zynga show starring myself, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely, lovely, lovely show may find you. I hope you're doing swimmingly. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Hope you're well hydrated, well rested and all those things in between. So I've just finished watching back-to-back games, um, Arsenal hosting Bayern Munich and Man City going away at Real Madrid. And those matches, especially in the Champions League nowadays, they are always weirdly depressing because it's always a stark, stark reminder as to how far away United are from playing at that level. Um, and I don't mean at that level in terms of just being in the Champions League. I mean playing at that level, that kind of intensity, that kind of skill, the quality. We are so far away from being at that level. It's quite scary. And I don't think our fans or our fan base quite realises just how far away we are from catching up to those teams. And the really sad and distressing thing is that however long it takes for us to get back to where we need to get back to, the other teams aren't stopping. The other teams aren't going to, you know, stand still. They're going to keep evolving. They're going to keep investing in their squads. They're going to go through different managers. They're going to try different styles of play. They might get lucky one season when another team falls off and they, you know, bang a couple of trophies. Life keeps moving on while we still have to sort ourselves out. So although the Ineos um, partial ownerships are somewhat flipping, you know, interesting and there are some things on the horizon that look good. So far, so good. It's so far, so, well, so far, it's just been waffle. There's not really been anything concrete apart from the appointment of that X-Man City CEO, but there hasn't really been anything that would really kind of give you the hope that we're going in the right direction. I'm somebody who's always thought that United definitely need, United, 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 definitely need um, the outgoings to be way more substantial than the incomings. I'm one of those people that believes that we need to have a real, real massive clean sweep we need to probably have at least six first teamers or six first team squad members out of that flipping squad immediately. And that includes a lot of fan favourites like the Bruno Fernandes of the of the sort, the Marcus Rashfords, the Luke Shaws, the Harry Maguire, the Scott McTominays. All these people need to get binned ASAP. And then we need a whole bunch of new fresh faces. And the thing with me, even if those players I mentioned were playing amazingly well, I'd still want a refresh. Those players have been at the club for so long. I feel like they also they also need a new challenge. All those players I mentioned probably need to go elsewhere um, to kind of, you know, to kind of revitalise their career and whatever it may be. They don't need to kind of be squandering their career at United, but a lot of them will probably stay at United because we pay pretty well, as we've seen with Donny van der Beek and how his career has kind of panned out um, to be a bit of a horror show. He stayed at United probably a couple of seasons too long. Um, obviously, injuries didn't help him in between. But as soon as he realised that he wasn't in favour with any manager he's kind of been under, he probably should have packed his bag and left. But now his career's in tatters. He went to Eintracht Frankfurt on loan. I watched a few games of theirs. He hasn't played. And when he has played, he's been incredibly anonymous. Um, the recent game he just played last week, or the couple, no, this weekend, sorry, this past weekend, he didn't come off on, he didn't come on off from the bench. So it's been a pretty crazy time um, for him on loan. And that, I think it's partly to do with the club playing so well. Because a club plays so well, players like Donny van der Beek don't really need or don't really want to leave because they're not really going to get that salary elsewhere. And if I'm not mistaken, to make matters even worse for Donny van der Beek, I'm pretty sure his girlfriend or fiancé was pregnant at around the same time that he was going through what he was going through. So he probably wanted to stack some money, stay. And obviously with your girlfriend being pregnant, the last thing you want to do is maybe change, you know, clubs and move to a whole different country. So it all kind of just worked out for him to stay a little bit. But obviously now his career has suffered. He's not really got, you know, he hasn't really played consistent football in a long time. Um, He's out of the national team, although he is a really important member of that national team for a short period of time. And now his career looks like it's over before he even got a chance to really get going. And that's all to do with mismanagement, United obviously selling him dreams. But a lot of our players are in that position. So I would much rather the club take a hit in terms of terminating contracts in terms of upsetting a few folk, even benching people and putting people out of the squad and some shit. Like, we need to clean sweep so desperately because as great as the managers were on display, right, that were obviously there, you got the two shores, you got the peps of this world. As great as these managers are, you got the, obviously Arteta, but 
I don't think a lot of these managers would be where they are without the club investing heavily in the players. Like, I think all of the clubs that play today, Real Madrid, Man City, Arsenal, Bayern Munich, I think any rational United fan will swap a lot of their players for ours. Um, so they clearly have better teams and better players, better squads to pick from, which will definitely mean they're going to play better football. But we've all seen Bayern Munich in the league. They recently lost 3-2 um, just this past weekend and they look pretty awful. But then when they turn up to the Champions League, most of their players know, hey, this is our only shot for actual silverware. So guess what happens? They turn up, they show up and they put in a sick performance and they were very, 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 very close to winning that game. Um, they probably should have won that game, actually. If you see the flipping, did you see the, the decision that Arsenal um, got away with? Absolutely incredible. So there was a crazy decision where it was a goal kick to Arsenal. Um, David Raya gets the ball. He puts it down in the box to kick it. Then he passes it square to Gabriel, I think. And he picks the ball up and then puts it back down again and kicks the goal kick again. So clearly it was a handball in the box and it should have been a clear penalty. But for some reason, the referee didn't give it because it was a schoolyard error. You can't give schoolyard errors during Champions League games, which is absolutely bonkers, to be honest. But that was his explanation for why he didn't give the penalty. So Bayern Munich were quite close to actually winning. This is actually the quote, courtesy of Fabrizio Romano here um, on the old Twitter. He says as follows, too short. The referee made a huge mistake. There was a penalty handball. Uh, I know it's a crazy situation. They put the ball down. He whistles. The defender takes the ball with his hands. What makes us really angry is the explanation on the pitch. He told our players it was a kid's mistake. A kid's mistake. And he won't give a penalty that in the Champions League quarterfinal. It's horrible. Horrible explanation. Kid's mistake. Adult mistake. Whatever. We feel angry because it was a huge decision against us. And I definitely agree with him. Huge decision. And if you see it here, there's a gif actually. Someone put together that shows it. So he passes it. And then Gabriel puts the ball down again and passes it back to the goalkeeper. That's a handball because the ball's already in place, especially because he passed it forward. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, you can't just decide to retake the goal kick when you want to retake it. So that should have been a penalty. Um, Bayern Munich should have got a, a penalty then. I think it was 2-1 at that point, And that would have wrapped up the game at 3-1. But it didn't obviously change. And it's just another example of just how poor the referee standards are across Europe or the world in general. It's interesting. It's always really baffled me how one of the most lucrative sports in the world, right? One of the most lucrative sports in the world where players are played, players are paid incredibly high salaries, managers are compensated really, really well. The refereeing standards is really fucking shoddy across the board. Referees are terrible. And I don't know, part of me doesn't know if it's like by design, whether the football industry or the football, you know, or football in general, the governing bodies don't want to have really good referees or really, you know, strict officiating because they're in their heads, it takes the fun and unpredictability out of the game. I think the part of them love the chaos. They love the chaos of like a referee getting a call wrong, even when it goes to fucking VAR, which is, which I love nowadays because VAR was meant to kind of be the great equalizer. It was meant to get rid of all kind of human mistakes because you could go back and rewatch it on the video. But what it's shown is that, you know, it's, if it's humans watching the video, they're still going to make human mistakes, right? Or they're still going to make unforced errors, whatever it may be. And we're seeing those repeat again and again and again. Although the one thing I do like about Champions League referees, they do make decisions right quickly you know in the Premier League the, the, the referees take ages to decide whether or not something is a foul or not but I feel like in the Champions League they do make it very very fast to kind of figure out okay cool this is a foul this isn't a foul and they kind of go from there but um, Arsenal um, vs Bayern Munich very entertaining game um, I love seeing Leo Sane play like oh Musiala players on the wings like th those are actual wingers with that kind of pace and the funny thing about Leroy Sane actually he he's had plenty of of injuries recently that have kind of sidelined him and if I'm you know being a big Leroy Sane fan he for sure he for sure um has had a lot of injuries that I feel like have taken away from his explosiveness right but today against Arsenal what we saw was that despite his you know injuries over time he's still incredibly explosive over the you know over five to ten yards he still is able to kind of dart in you know in front of defenders and fucking rip through them and whatever because that the penalty that he got or the penalty that he won for the second goal 
was incredible. I think to, I think towards the end, I think he's in his own half, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he gets a ball for Noya, who also controls it amazingly well, passes it out to Liwe Sane, and he somehow is able to kind of like scoop the ball, I think, behind. I think Ben White, he does like a little flick around him, spins around him and just starts running. And that acceleration over like, what is it? Five to 10 to 20 yards, incredible. And you see a lot in professional football, even in regular football, if you go watch players in the league, anybody that's, ever, anybody that's able to run at a player really, really fast is a threat, especially if your dribbling skills are amazing. So he just runs really straight at you and then kind of, you know, does a little body feint, flicks the ball left or right, keeps on running, like incredible. I actually would have preferred to see him finish the shot, but he probably wouldn't have finished it. He probably would have, um, you know, hit at the goalkeeper because he was going quite wide and to generate that power to hit back on target would have been pretty hard. But that was an incredible, incredible run, man. I do recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Um, Arsenal v. Bayern, I mean, a really good game. And then also, you see, Arsenal came back pretty well. Um, the substitutions definitely helped Mikel Teta bringing on, um, what's his face, um, Trossard and Gabriel Jesus was an really really good sub just when they needed it um jesus did amazingly well holding up the ball up front and trossard's finishing like sublime finishing um the goal was re really well done gabriel just used to get inside the box jinking um you know doing some feints and dragging the ball and then having the foresight because at first i thought he got tackled and the ball went to trossard no he actually passed it into trossard instead of being greedy and then trossard was able to kind of just like head down finish it bottom corner absolutely brilliant game i loved it really good back and forth game and I'm really eager to, and looking forward to seeing the next leg, which is going to be away. Um, and I think Arsenal have a good chance. I'm not going to lie. I actually, I actually put down Arsenal to win this game. Personally, I had them down to win two one. So I'm surprised. I'm not surprised they played so well. I just think they probably should have, you know, maybe went for the jug a little bit more. Um, the counter attack from Bayern was always there. They didn't know really how to deal with it. The pace of Leroy Sane and the trickery of Musiala as well was confusing them all over the place. All over the place. Sorry, Leon Goretzka was really good as well in centre midfield. So they had a lot of issues to sort out. But all in all, I think Arsenal played well and most likely will have a fair chance to win the next leg when they go away to Bayern Munich. I definitely think so. I definitely think so. Next, quickly, I wanted to check out this and comment on this because I forgot. I didn't actually talk about this, I don't think. So this has been confirmed a while back already. But um, Alessandro Michele, um, the, the former designer, former crazy director of Gucci, is now the creative director of Valentino, which is great news for me personally because I'm a big, 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 big fan of Alessandro Michele. I thought that, you know, when he was around at Gucci, he definitely was one of the big three, you know, the Demners of this world, the Musha Pradas, the Raf Simmons, um, I can't think of anybody else. Like I feel on top of my head, the JW Andersons. He was definitely in that category, the Mark Jacobs, those elite designers. So I was actually surprised to see Gucci part ways with him when they did part ways with him. But I guess they wanted just a refresh. Um, that whole kitschy Gucci type of look was maybe getting a bit played out, but I still think the shows are fantastic the clothes were amazing and the kind of ambiance and everything he created around it was just sublime and definitely like a cultural moment that people kind of were really kind of in tune with so i was surprised that gucci would kind of you know um sack that off in favor of going in house and then i think um, um what you call it hiring that guy um what's his name sabato i think i forgot sabato the discerner i think his name is right as a new creative director at the moment so that was a surprising exit but now he's got a new job at valentino which is going to be great i think he's going to do amazing stuff there i can't wait to see how he takes you know his aesthetic his codes and kind of imbues it onto um Valentino considering the extensive history they have and I think it's no surprise really Valentino was a bit boring for a while um as great as everybody kind of regards some of their previous collections and especially some of the menswear stuff um I've always loved and appreciate a lot of the coats and obviously the Valentino army sneaker which has definitely had a hold on the streets but overall 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 the, this, the collection was, or the, sorry, the brand in general was kind of going through a bit of a loss. So I'm not surprised that Gucci decided, sorry, that Valentino decided to make the change and hire the former Gucci manager. So this is courtesy of um, The Guardian. It says Alessandro Michele, the former creative director of Gucci, has been appointed as a creative director of the Couture House of Valentino. In November 2022, um, the announcement ends after the much anticipated speculation that where, where he would go next. The designer said of his new role at the Rome based brand is incredible honor. I feel the immense joy and huge responsibility to join a Maison de Couture that has the word beauty carved into collective story and made a distinctive elegance, refinement, and extreme grace. Michele is to thank or to blame for 
of the era of kitsch, maximalism, gender fluidity, geek chic and unabashed crookedness. His Gucci aesthetic was the polar opposite of the quiet luxury that prevailed in recent times. Harry Styles and Billie Eilish were fans of the design of Gucci, which he enjoyed in 2015. Yeah, so again, I'm, I'm eager to see it because already look, look at one of these last Gucci collections for in 2019. Um, as much as it was hit by a controversy that just it just says something right it's got an opinion it's got a point of view it's got an aesthetic you know you can't ignore it especially the style that he does so i'm eager to see what he does at valentino um it continues under michelli gucci's revenues almost tripled but his tenure wasn't without controversy gucci was um, embroiled in a race row in 2019 after which the polo neck that criticized said that critics said it was embroiled the blackface was pulled from the sale oh yeah i remember that Do you guys remember that that was absolutely one of the most crazy fucking things ever that that became such a big deal such a nothing issue but you know people were out for blood and were screaming black lives matter so anything that kind of pertained to insulting or demeaning of black people people were very quick to kind of jump on it it continued in the same year, the, the, a model stage of mental health protest during the brand's Milan Fashion Week, wearing a high fashion take on a straight jacket, a model held up his hands on which it says mental health is not fashion. Michele will succeed Pio Paolo Piccolio, um, Pio Sciolio, P, how, how do you say his name? Piccolio, it says Pio Paolo, the much loved industry figure who stepped down at Valentino last week after more than two decades of the brand. He will still, he will start his job at Valentino HQ near Spanish um, Steps next week. His debut collection of the house will be reported at Paris Fashion Week in September so um yeah before some video got to Pierre Paolo by the way like two decades at one brand 20 years in one job and then basically getting fired is pretty heartbreaking but you know he he had his time in the sun he was able to tell an incredible story throughout that time it kind of petered out and kind of fell fit flat towards the end but still he had a brilliant brilliant run and more than likely he'll probably be snapped up by a number of brands anyway sooner rather than later whenever someone else gets fired during the whole process so i'm eager to see what um alessandro michele does at valentino come september i think it's going to be refreshing um to see him again and to see what he does with valentino and i think he's a necessary voice in fashion and i'm happy to see him back i am happy to see him back randomly i saw this clip i wanted to talk about this is regarding yuri this is courtesy of a no jumper subreddit and the title is features as you can see here the title says as follows yuri refuses to shower says it's too much and he's too tired hygiene isn't a priority so let's play this video clip for you so you can see you know just the beautiful the amazing you know um catch that is fucking yuri absolutely stupendous flipping video this is let's play this in here how about you go take a shower? I will not shower today. I don't want to. It's too much. I showered earlier before we left. Um. Larry dropped a bag of two dollars. Yuri, nice try. You haven't showered since Saturday afternoon, and we all know it. You've been on stream for eight days. Remember, you didn't shower yesterday. Please get your hygiene in order because people are starting to attack Riley for your lack of hygiene. I don't give a fuck. I'm not showering. T tonight. 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 I just don't want to. I'm tired, bro. Now you're tired. Yeah, I'm exhausted. No, like, not. I'm too tired to shower. I'm, t like, not tired enough to, like, take another shot, a shot and party. But, but for a shower, come on. That's just gonna bring, that's like, that's gonna bring the vibes down. Do we really want to kill the vibes over a stupid shower? Come on, think about it, guys. So imagine, imagine not showering while on vacation. Again, if you're not watching the video, this is Yuri talking into a camera while they're in a room somewhere. So I guess they're doing some sort of traveling around America. Maybe they're going back to where Riley's grew up or something. I don't know. But they're in a room somewhere, maybe an Airbnb, chilling, having a good time. And he's on camera with his girlfriend lying on a bed saying, basically, I'm not going to shower until tomorrow, which will probably make it, what, four days since the day of his recording. He hasn't showered. Can you imagine being away abroad, traveling, whatever you are? It doesn't even matter if it's in the same country. Just traveling anywhere without showering for four fucking days. And this is why I say that I really understand what Sharp meant about Riley. Sharp said oh, all these people online talk about how hot Riley is, right? As like a kind of diss to Yuri. Oh, I can't believe you treat Riley horrible because she's hot, which is weird anyway, right? As if like Riley only deserves respect because she's attractive looking, right? But then you also said something like, which I kind of stuck to me, it was like, 
you have to also judge a girl like that who's willing to live who's willing to be with a guy as like gross as yuri right he's number one he's not even that good looking like you have to be probably quite good looking to get away with the whole not sharing thing or maybe just have a monster dick right have a monster fucking schlong or maybe just look incredible in the face like fucking fucking timothy chamelay incredible in the face right like a little twink angel thing but yuri isn't even that cute and i don't know about the schlong so he's just you know he has a girlfriend that's able to put up with this shit even though he's not that cute and he probably doesn't have that big of a dick anyway but just in general that aside just in terms of your own hygiene not wanting to shower for four days is absolutely insane it beggars belief why you'd want to do that because forget forget how your girlfriend would react because again i think it's, he's probably lucky that he's met his like life partner or he's met his soulmate i've already said it plenty of times i don't think yuri and riley are ever gonna break up i think just sometimes in life you can get lucky and meet somebody who's the perfect match for you but sometimes it could be for the best and for the worst so you might meet the perfect match for you that's also destructive as you are and you both come together and you become the next fucking bobby and whitney without all the money without all the fame and without all the fucking paparazzi and then you both die in the middle of a tub somewhere right or you can meet somebody who's kind of the polar opposite but you both kind of work work well with each other because you're so different but then you so similar in some ways with them two they're obviously very destructive and they kind of suit each other really well so it's not like Riley's gonna go anywhere so forget doing it for her why not just do it for you whenever I'm abroad or whenever I take a trip especially I don't even go that far I use the max fucking flights that I take are like six hours or something right but if I'm going to like Berlin or something for the weekend and I leave my house in the morning like sometimes imagine this I'll, I'll, I'll get the fucking horrible early flight to leave London to go to Berlin at like 6 a.m the flight lands in Berlin at like nine or something right and at that 6 a.m before I've left the house most likely I've showered because usually I can't sleep before I fly anyway. I'm super like nervous and shit about missing my flight and look, forget my passport and all that nonsense. So most of the time I've showered at night before I go to bed or I've showered in the morning before I've left. Get on the plane. I, I arrive at my destination. And as soon as I land, as soon as I arrive at the Airbnb or the hotel, the first thing I want to do is jump in the shower. That's the first thing I do. Especially when I get to Airbnb, where's the towels? Do you know what I mean? The first thing I want to do is fucking shower. Even though I've already had a shower, like what? by that time like eight hours before prior still that kind of smut that kind of like you know the smut the dust just a fucking airport you know stink being in a fucking plane with randoms for that many hours all the stuff you touch i just want to you know you just want to feel fresh again kind of get yourself you know um acclimated with the fucking with the location that you're at and kind of go from there so the fact that yuri doesn't want to do it is odd because for me i find showers or washing myself or having some level of like hygiene quite refreshing it actually kind of gives me another bit of a pep it kind of gives me a little bit of a bounce it kind of allows me to kind of okay cool this is the next part of my day like hey you shower before bed cool now it's bedtime you shower in the morning okay cool it triggers i don't know showering after work or showering flipping showering after a workout showering before you go to work do you know what i mean it's kind of like a psych signifier of like you starting your day and kind of getting things going it's like having the first coffee in the morning type of thing so the fact that he doesn't shower and the fact that in this screenshot or when i've paused it right now he's scratching his head most likely because he hasn't you know if he doesn't shower he definitely doesn't shampoo his hair he definitely doesn't wash his hair in any kind of way it's kind of gross it really fucking is so as much as people like to talk about riley being hot which is subjective it's hard to really rate a girl like that when she's with a guy like this do you know what i mean it's hard to take someone like that seriously. You can't, you, you almost lose points because you're dating such a disgusting dude. It should be like that really and truly. You don't gain points by dating somebody that doesn't, ref refuses to fucking wash under their armpits or behind their knees. It's absolutely incredible. Honestly, absolutely disgusting. So yeah, um, Yuri and Riley, um, like I said before, in plenty of times on this stream, um, our flock, also on this stream, on this fucking podcast, are absolutely made for each other. And I don't see them ever breaking up anytime soon. I think people who hope that because he treats her like shit are wishing on a prayer. Um, if he was gonna, she was gonna break up with him because of how he, you know, bullies her and gaslights her and just a general dickhead, she would have left ages ago. The fact that she's still there means she's there for the long haul and she ain't going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. She ain't going anywhere. Moving on. There's this post courtesy of Milagro, um, also known as Mob's World, that I'm actually quite happy about. I'm not going to lie. I saw this and it actually made me quite happy. So allegedly, Young Miami from the City Girls has this 
um, Twitter account no, has, an, has, has a finster, that's it. Young Miami from the City Girls has a finster that somebody allegedly found and they were able to get, you know, access to it by follow. Because usually when people have finsters, which is basically a private Instagram that you have where you can post up all your fucking madness shit that you get up to um, without all your friends and family seeing. But usually when people have a finster, um, you know, it's usually trusted friends and family because you're going to be posting some racist shit on there so the fact that some random person was able to get access to it is mad but somebody did get access to young miami's insta and they saw one of her stories she's booed up and you know got the arch going and a massive you know massive batty here looking at some hotel somewhere balcony hugging up on fucking diddy as you can see right she's got diddy there hugged up on him clearly um, showing that they're still together so even though Diddy's going through what he's going through with all the allegations and accusations and the fucking homeland security coming in and all the whatever um cut the feds coming in and fucking you know um, ransacking his house and putting his kids in cuffs and shit clearly even though you know he's been accused of some very very dicey dicey things young Amy is still there and I actually quite like this I'm not gonna lie one of the things I hate about observing from the outside looking in one of the things i hate about cancel culture is that you see all the rats jumping from the ship as soon as somebody gets can and usually when somebody gets cancelled it's not somebody that's not popular it's somebody that's like got a relatively you know good level of fame is well known um clouded up has money do you know what I mean it's somebody of some sort of stature so it's always interesting to see when that person gets cancelled the amount of people that legitimately run for the hills because this person got cancelled, like, oh my god, I can't be seen, I can't be seen, I can't be seen, it's like, no, 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 we all know that you knew, most likely, right, or we don't care, but most likely we know, nine times out of ten, if you're friends with somebody, especially someone like Diddy, and he's up to all that fuck shit, it's unlikely that you never saw it, especially if you're that close to him, it's unlikely you're never, you weren't involved, even though Young Miami only started, like, you know, dealing with Diddy fairly recently in his life, we all assume that you took part in it, or that you were involved or that you were aware we all just assume it it is what it is so jumping off the ship and trying to kind of save face and pretend like you don't know the guy now that he's going through what he's going through it's kind of disingenuous and also doesn't really convince us because we already know that you were with the guy and you were partying and had a good time with him so if anything it's quite it's way more admirable even though it's a horrible situation and the allegations are absolutely egregious it's actually way more it's it's kind of way more honorable to stand by somebody who's getting cancelled over something very heinous as opposed to jumping ship it says more about you if you stand by the person legitimately and in the case of diddy because the accusations are so bad in his mind i'd imagine he's seen the difference of people just abandoning him now the allegations are out there he's probably definitely seen a very stark dip in the amount of messages he gets dms people calling his phone like it's completely over for him right no one's no one's inviting him to go out and shit it's fucking quiet it's crickets over there so if anything if i'm diddy i would probably be like you know what if i'm a narcissistic guy and i think i didn't do anything wrong and i'm always right blah, blah, blah i'm justified to doing what i'm doing i'd probably think to myself i know now who my real friends are now i'm in this situation i know now who my real codies are and if if there is a scenario where he does get off and he does and he is found quote unquote innocent of all the crimes in the court of law he would definitely be you know letting his nuts hang and reminding people yeah don't worry i remember i remember the people who stood up for me i remember people who didn't and no you know considering the amount of money he has it might be beneficial for people because he would then maybe be very generous to the people who definitely held him down so as egregious and as bad as this picture is to see young Miami still there you know hanging out with a guy who's been accused of grape and shit I kind of like that she's still holding him down I'm not gonna lie as toxic as it is as horrendous as it is it's quite nice to see that she's still delivering um fucking Diddy's pink cocaine allegedly she's still delivering the molly allegedly she's still delivering you know um sex workers allegedly herself included I quite like it I'm not gonna lie I like to see that she's still there in the mix and doing that fucking malarkey so big up her but we also need to return to a world where people's finsters don't get exposed i'm not gonna lie the whole concept of a finster is that you can do whatever you want to do on there like i've seen people on i forgot the app i think the app is called like omegly or gomely i forgot what the app is called it's some sort of app it's, it's similar interface to tiktok and a lot of people go on there and do madness like mostly you know going on there and basically showing themselves doing drugs and shit from what i've seen anyway and i've seen some other people kind of live stream on there i forgot i think it's called omegly or something like that one of the type of um, apps but 
you know, most likely that will get shut down too. But in general, the Finsta stuff is like, because we all know Instagram in general, people take way too much. People take Instagram too seriously. They're a bit, they're too afraid to like upload random things. They just want everything to look like a highlight reel of their best moments in life. They don't want to appear lame or uncool or boring. So people put way too much on you know, importance on what to upload and when to upload it, which is, means most people are quite tight with their uploads. I'm sure most of you guys can attest and maybe with your own Instagram profiles. I know when I used to upload on there, I would upload way more stories than Instagram posts because I just felt more comfortable just throwing up random shit on the stories. But the whole Finster thing is meant to loosen the burden, meant to loosen the grip, loosen the shackles of fucking Instagram and make it fun again so that you can post random shit without the pressures of, oh my God, is this showing me in a cool light? Um, is Are there too many selfies? Have I gone anywhere interesting? Do I hang out with a cool person? You, know I mean? you can just go crazy on your Finster and enjoy yourself, obviously with a you know, trusted audience or family and friends. So the fact that people are out there, you know, going out of their way to fucking expose people's bloody um instagrams and stuff private ones i don't like it i'm not gonna lie i think that's fucking lame but i guess in this sense because of the crimes that have been he's been accused of maybe it's some um, some sort of like public good that this thing was exposed maybe 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 moving on moving on we've got some interesting news here courtesy of fugger daily fugger daily have a very interesting update regarding the ysl rico look at this the state has confirmed that Gunnar will not be called to witness in a stand in the Young Fug and YSL Rico trial. So all that hoopla about Young about Gunnar being a snitch and you know throwing his guy Young Fug under the fucking bus might be premature because he's not about to actually get on the stand and point out Young Fug or snitch on him. Even though he did technically still snitch to get out of jail, um, he did have to go on the stand and admit young if what you call it and admit YSL was an organized crime gang syndicate, whatever, and obviously attribute to some of the slat slime stuff. It's now looking like the thing that he said he wouldn't do, he's not gonna do in terms of getting on the stand and actually saying that shit. Which I think should help people's perception of him because I have to admit, like, you know, I'm a big Gunner fan, but even I've kind of like been put off listening to his music ever since that shit went down. It's kind of just doesn't hit the same. Whenever you're seeing Gunner online, looking incredibly fit, wearing wearing great clothes, putting out music videos and great albums and living his life, the first thing I think about whenever I see Gunner now is Young Fug. I'm like, fuck, look at the contrast. You're out here in the best shape of your life, looking healthy, clear-minded, clear-eyed, you know, still crushing it in your career. And your boy Young Fug, who basically brought you in, right? Your your quote unquote OG is sitting in court, you know, looking very bloated from all the fucking shit food he's been eating, and you know, sitting down waiting for this trial to fucking, you know, to end. That looks like it one might be one of the longest um, trials ever in the history of the fucking world. I think last time I read they had like seven hundred fucking witnesses and shit. So it's just hard to kind of click with Gunner nowadays because you just know what he did to get out of jail so early and the funny thing is i remember reading no i remember watching loads of youtube documentaries you know the ones that do stuff on gangs and one loads of them basically said the same thing they all said that ghana was never going to be in jail for long anyway if he just would have like you know held it down without having to get on stand and say oh yeah ysl is a fucking gang and shit he would have still got out because there was nothing really tying him to any of the explicit or more egregious crimes that fucking ysl were accused of he would have been fine if he just would have been patient but i guess the whole reason why the the state or the police wanted to bring him in was because they were probably confident that he would flip because he's an artist because he's not really about it in terms of the lifestyle in terms of being on the road and stuff and being a fucking gangster he was most likely to flip because you know he actually had a career to kind of look after but it's just a bit hard because it's kind of unfortunately for him it's forever tainted him you know in the eyes of a lot of people myself included um, and it's kind of made it hard to listen to him so if this is the case he's not going to testify on the stand or not be a witness or not be called to witness this is might be a good thing for his rep because it's, I've also noticed, I'm sure some of you have, all the pictures of Ghana, with the exceptions of the one, I think recently with Offset and somebody else, he's always by himself. He's never with his rap group of friends, no more little baby pictures, no more hanging out with Meek Mill, um, you know, not, nothing. It's just always him and his team. 
it's just always on his own. So it kind of seems like a bit of a lonely existence. He went from being incredibly popular with a small group of rappers, with the elite group of rappers out there and being, you know, one of the cool guys. And now no one wants to be associated with him because he's been marked as a snitch or as a rat. You know what I mean? So hopefully this development will change that because, you know, I'm a big fan of Uganda still. But I don't think it will because I think a lot of people will still think, We'll still remember that yes ma'am um you know court appearance where he was clearly uh, making it very clear to the judge that YSL was an organized gang so that he could leave early and he didn't need to do it like I said because if you were just sat down for according to these prison youtubers and shit if you would have sat down for a few weeks he would have been got out but I'm not too sure how true that is myself because if I'm not mistaken I don't think there's many people who have got out on bail or have kind of got out at all um during the YSL Rico case the judge has been very strict in terms of not letting anybody leave or you know be um leave jail uh, until the fucking court case has commenced or until the court case has fucking ended so I'm not too sure maybe Gunner will still be in jail now if he didn't fucking squeal who knows either way great development for him and hopefully that is a change that he needs to have to kind of go on and do other things going forward to go and do other things going forward next on the list we got this clip this is a funny clip because i legitimately do understand and agree with this meme that exists online that the worst thing to happen to the black community wasn't police brutality wasn't jim crow wasn't fucking um what you call it Kam uh, kamala harris wasn't fucking george bush um, you know, wasn't fucking, you know, Taylor Swift winning that fucking Grammy that time over Beyonce, um, wasn't Mac Lamont winning that Grammy over fucking Kendrick Lamar. The worst thing to happen to the black community in the 21st century was definitely the um, discovery of podcast mics, podcast studios and podcasts in general. Because listen to this, listen to this insane, insane clip featuring a legendary MC. Um <laughs> a legendary mc called chronic from slew them and also another legendary rapper called um young spray rtm um listen to this listen to what he has to say here because this might be another reason why we need to lock up all the microphones all the audio interfaces all the cameras all the fucking camera stands all the podcast studios around the world and not give black people any access to it anymore because look what people are saying on fucking podcasts look at what they're saying yeah. A woman comes into her prime when? When at, at the ages of like, they say 16, 17, 18 wow, wow, to like wow, 25. Wow, wow. Bro, I'm talking about... That's not a prime. No, bro. 16 ain't a woman's prime. You, Whoa. We don't get to write the prime. The that's prime... not what I'm telling you. That's that not their prime. We're not that talking about my sexual no, preferences, No, though. that's prime, not their prime. My prime is in my 40s. So yeah, I'm yeah that's not their prime. No, but I'm saying prime, even... No, 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 that's not your he prime. Sunk I'm telling you, my prime is my 40s. I know who I am as a woman. We're both sunk. Are you talking about childhood? What are you talking about prime? We're both sunk over each other. No one will understand. We're both sunk still. We're not sunk. You fool for 22 is mad, but you've now brought 22 to 16 and thinking that's the prime. Brother, You're thinking 16 is the brother, prime of brother, a woman. Brother, I'm telling you about the hold, statistics. Hold on, no. No, no, but I'm telling you about the hold statistics. Hold on, no. too far. What statistics? Hold <laughs> on, no. Are you all right? No, but There's, they can't. They can't. Hold they can't on, no. They can't. They can't. Hold on, no. 16 is not a woman's prime. facts out of anything. Yeah. But it's not her prime in get anything. Facts out of it. 16, she's still in school uniform. No, I didn't say 16. I said <laughs> from 16 to no. 25. Don't forget that bit. Huh? From 16 to 25. Oh, I didn't it, hear the 25. I know you was going mad. But even starting at 16 No, but that's when, uh, that's when it starts from, though. No, You're that's saying that's the their prime, prime yeah? Well, she's no. saying it's not. Stop yeah. saying she's I'm a woman. Saying, she's bro. saying that's not the prime. No, but you're saying I had no idea what was going on. I'm trying to say, I had no idea. Who's statistics, though? You're talking about statistics. Where is this? Google it and let us see. Bro, I don't need to go on your what phone. What are you talking about? Pregnancy? Like, fertile? When I, I need not to know ever when, land. where you found out that this is their prime. No, but I'll wait for everyone to stop gassing. Because after <laughs> when gassing. everyone stops gassing, no, no, I, yeah, it's not me you're going to do that to because I know what's going on. <laughs> and I definitely know. What's 16 you know? is a prime. 16 to 25 <laughs> is a woman's prime. sexual prime. It's sexual prime. prime. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, that's what, that's what it's... Yo, that's a mad double down, isn't it? 16 to 20 is a woman's sexual... Uh, like... I don't even know what the topic is of this conversation. I don't even know why they're speaking about this shit. But it's another indication of like when you get put when you put microphones in front of people and you just get them to talk, sometimes or inevitably they're gonna say some fucked up shit. Because we all don't have the capacity to speak about a broad range of subjects. We all can't do it. It's probably for the best if the majority of us, myself included, stick to like a, a particular niche 
zero in on subjects that you kind of know well well enough that you can kind of rant and ramble about for minutes and hours on end as opposed to trying to speak generally openly about stuff that you have no idea about on the fly you're always going to come up with some mad things but i can't ever picture a scenario where i'll be sitting down on the podcast with cameras recording saying to people hey yeah you know the prime of a woman is this and this it's like what what does that even mean? Like, what what kind of argument am I trying to make? Those are the type of arguments or hot takes you have to kind of really kind of run through your head before you say them or even write down or even rehearse or something. You can't just get on the fucking pod and decide this is what you're going to say and this is how you're going to stand on it, especially if you're not the most articulate person in the world, especially if you're getting easily rattled because nobody else in the room is, you know, rightfully agreeing with your fucking nonsense. This is one of the worst takes I've ever heard. But again, like I said, the worst thing to happen to the black community around the world was definitely the discovery of audio interfaces, microphones, cameras, podcast studios, and mic stands. I swear to fucking God. Thank I think yourself. he means reproductive prime. Thank He's yourself, saying she can yourself. have the, uh, the most reproductive. Well. He thinks no he means reproductive. Man, listen, man no 22 chat, is fine then. So 22 is fine, right? <sighs> I've already if 16 is... If 16 is all right do in I your write eyes, the do I write the statistics? If 16 but is do prime, I write the statistics? no, but I don't but even know them statistics. I, I, haven't exactly. Exactly. I don't even know I them. I, exactly. I, I, even, I even want to You're see it. That, I no, want no, you to no, no, Google no, wait, wait, wait. it so I can see that we, statistic. What we're worrying with now Look, is your Googling. moral. Imagine trying to war with somebody about something like this. But again, um, big up Chronic in some way, shape or form. He's been going through it anyway online. Um, there's been many and many discoveries out there that have kind of really rattled me to my core because... You know, being a big Grime fan when I was growing up, seeing somebody that I, you know, quote unquote, looked up to as an MC and thought was absolutely amazing, um, go through this weird phase where he's now becoming a a really vocal, outspoken guy on like spaces and shit, and then having people expose him for you know getting up to some madness in his own private life and shit. It's like wow, man, seeing some of your heroes that you grew up on when you were in kid in secondary school now kind of you know be shown in a light to be people that you know might be into some questionable things. It's kind of weird, um, but it's also interesting in the in the UK how. We don't really have a lot of the stuff that we have in the States where people really go hard at people when they get exposed, you know, for certain things in the bedroom and people kind of play it really close to their chest. I wonder if it's because they're scared of getting beaten up or if in general, you, you know, you don't want to risk a lawsuit. I don't know, but it's interesting change. Cause I think if, if, if Chronic was American and somebody discovered what he did or the pictures that he, of what he did were leaked it would be non-stop news all over the place. But because he's from the UK or he's from London, no one's really touching it with a barge pole, which is funny to put. But yeah, you know what I mean? Like all the big, you know, black urban media fucking platforms are really trying to avoid it. But it's probably for the good. It's probably for the best because he's saying all this stuff without people watching him. Imagine if people start watching him. You know what I mean? So maybe it's for the best that people are not paying attention. But in general, um, worst thing to happen to the black community is definitely the ingestion of microphones. I swear to God. I swear to flipping God. Moving on. I want to quickly highlight this and give you guys a recommendation for new albums to check out. So I've been absolutely banging and slapping Concrete Boys. It's Us Volume 1. Um, obviously, Concrete Boys is the group that Lil Yachty's put together. It's now his... I think his best musical group, he's definitely, I think, learned from previous years um, or previous iterations with having the sailing team and I think another one in between. But Lil Yachty, I think, has finally found his group, his little musical project, protege, label, artist that he can definitely be pushing going forward because It's Us Volume 1 is really, really good. Um, it's almost way more mature and polished than they probably have any right to be because i think it's a pretty recently put together collective but probably it helps that i think before this album dropped they went on tour together so i'm thinking maybe that tour they went on um as maybe as maybe um hasty as it was was a smart decision because it got them all to kind of bond and connect and kind of be around each other for a long time and then put the album together there's a lot of familiarity they feel very comfortable around each other they kind of work really well on certain tracks like i don't know how to describe it but i think that might have helped but in general the confidence of this album is really good or compilation whether ep mix if you want to call it the first track is i wouldn't even call it a conventional hip-hop track it kind of starts off a bit airy and you know all over the place and shit and um I feel like that was a great way, a great primer to tell you that this was going to be a very confident 
um, debut from this group or from, yeah, from this group that he has under his label. And, you know, throughout it, I think everybody did really well. I think that's a good thing you have to also say. Everybody in the collective, um, you know, from fucking Camo, from the guy, um, what you call it, DC2 Trill, from Draft Day, um, from Caribou, obviously fucking Lil Yatty, everybody smashed it. No one was outshined by the other. But if we do have to take special attention, we have to definitely pay special attention to Caribou. We definitely have to pay attention to Caribou. Caribou, she absolutely floated on the entirety of this fucking tape. She floated. One of my favorite tracks on there is definitely not the two. And Caribou's had a bit of a hard time lately. A lot of people online have been kind of dissing her freestyles, saying that she's not that great, blah, 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 questioning her place in the in the game, questioning why Little Yatty's pushing her so much. There's been suggestions that maybe Little Yatty and her are fucking. That's why he's pushing her so hard. But I get why he likes her she's got she's got that i think she mentions even on the tape that like people think that she's on she's got low iron or something because she's so like you know deadpan and kind of chill almost ice spice ish in her kind of delivery but i think her tonality um her lyricism her melodies and shit i think that's why he likes her because she seems to be the most versatile of the crew if you had to pick i'd say probably in terms of a straight up rapper this, I think this guy Camu, I think the Camu is this one, he's probably the most well-rounded. He's probably the one that probably will end up doing, you know, loads of different versions of conventional type of hip-hop music going forward. But in terms of uh, versatility and going into different type of genres and shit, I could definitely see Caribou doing, you know, going into bass, going into jungle, doing fucking house stuff. Like I could definitely see her going into more electronic PC music type of thing if she went to do that. She definitely has the range for it. Um, but I've been a big fan of hers ever since the fucking freestyle, innit? What was it again? You asked for hoes, I brought them round and you ain't flipping one. So as you can tell, amazing, great rapper for me personally. Love her flow. Love the deadpan delivery. Um, you know, love some of the fucking wordplay. Like, just incredible. I'm a big fan of hers. But yeah, one of my favorite tracks on the album is definitely not the two. That features Caribou essentially going absolutely crazy on the whole entire um, track itself. Um, the, the opening verse, which one you work in, all the plug faking, ain't doing no good, could tell you that you're real hurting. Mm, he said this pussy is ox bar which is you know you know you know but he gonna send a cop car gun in the boot i'm an outlaw moi bitch your is im imic your bitches are mac the bitches are back get in the whip bitch get in the whip bitch get in the whip bitch i recommend you check it out it's really amazing um really good tracks overall i think it's like 10 tracks long not that long at all to cut oh it's 16 it feels like a little shorter than that. Fucking hell, I thought it was shorter. I thought, okay. It's six, 16 tracks long there, not 10 tracks. But really impressive, confident debut from Concrete. Looking to hear more from them going forward. Very great versatility in terms of group in terms of what they can what can they what they can offer musically and again i'm eager to see what they can do going forward and obviously live shows as well is going to be sick I'm, I'm assuming they're probably going to do all the big festivals and shit but yeah incredibly confident um debut big up little yatty i think he definitely solved it and got the great the correct collective together they definitely are fucking hard i'm a big big fan so definitely check out concrete if you haven't already definitely check out concrete if you haven't already the collective is strong the collective is very 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 strong moving on we've got another album to recommend this one's definitely my favorite and this is definitely one of my potential album of the years so if you're wondering hey guess you know is there one album that you'd recommend to me to listen to this year alone i definitely will tell you to check out fabiana paladino Fabiana Palladino self-titled her debut album wow 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 this is for me quintessential pop music which I'm a big fan of um you know sprinklings of like synth pop sprinklings of disco sprinklings of funk um sprinklings of like 80s R&B like it's so fucking good and if you're wondering why it's so good and why it's so mature she allegedly is um a singer songwriter who's done a lot of stuff with Jay Paul back in the day I didn't really know to be honest apart from reading stuff about her recently I didn't know that she was actually featured on a lot of early Jay Paul um stuff back in the day when it dropped so it's no surprise that a lot of the stuff is really good and she's even got a, a track here with Jay Paul called I Care Number no. Five that's fucking banger um really um emotional um really um just feelings laden track 
Um, it's it, it could, I, I can imagine it's going to sound incredible performed live, really fucking confident. But my favorite track on the album, my favorite track is track number two, Can't Look in the Mirror. There's a few singles on there, but track number two, Can't Look in the Mirror, is such a bop. Um, if you know anything about me, you know the kind of funk, disco type of stuff that I like, um, especially, you know, stuff that I've kind of heard recently from like The Weeknd and even Tory Lanez before he went to jail. Like he dropped a really good um, tape that had a similar sort of like 80s sort of, sort of vibe. And Can You Look in the Mirror reminds of that but one of the things that the track reminds me of I was thinking about it it reminds me of this legendary track by Azarian Third called Hungry for the Power and it also reminds me of the legendary um, Hercules and Love Affair You Belong so if you've heard You Belong by Hercules Love Affair and Hungry for the Power by Azarian Free back in the day you would remember what why I would like something like Can You Look in the Mirror and of course um, Metro Area as well um, what's that song by Metro Area it's like da 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 so, the, so I think those three tracks actually will actually work really well in a mix. If you want to mix Can You Look in the Mirror together, um, they would actually work really well. So there's a track by, I think, is it called Metro Area or Metro Arena? Oh, it's called Metro Area. That's just the thing. The group is called Metro Area. And the track is called Mura, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard back in the day. But that Mura track definitely reminds you of Can You Look in the Mirror, one of my standout tracks, favorite tracks on there. Um, she's actually performing in London in the Village Underground, I think, end of may or something whatever it is i'm definitely gonna go and see her live this time i will go if i'm not mistaken and she actually was at rough trade east recently i'm um, doing a signing and shit and a little performance which i probably should have went to but again i'm always fucking flopping with this shit but i'm pretty sure that she's performing in london on may or something if i've seen it where's there we go yeah so she's performing in london um was it may 23rd at the village underground so, so i'm definitely going to be checking that out actually let's see if we can actually see tickets can we see tickets today let's go village underground and see tickets let's see what they've got for us i'm assuming tickets will be like 30 quid maybe 25 pounds but i definitely want to go check her out because wow i was really impressed by that debut album by um fabiana paladino okay chloe Calais is also djing there let's go down may somewhere right who's also playing here Lewis Culture, Lady Shaka, um, Hagen and Friends, you got Nimio, you got, oh, Bambi's DJing as well. Cool, she's really good as well. I like Bambi. That might be something to check out. Shabazz Palace, you got Lucia Britiana, and then down here, you should have Fabiana somewhere. There we go, Fabiana Paladina. Uh, Paladina. Oh, you also got Shea. Dow Festival, Dr. Rubens, man. Hmm, interesting. So um, let's see how much the tickets are. I'm assuming £20. Let's see. They don't, oh, so it's on, it's on a dice thing. Okay, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But the blurb is, Fabiana broke out in 2017 as one of the Paul's Institute's founding artists. After a shadowy classic R&B influence pop reached Joey Paul, the London musician has just released a self-titled debut album in which she confronts um, how a life should look in the absence of a traditional relationship and the family structures. The album produced by Palladino reflects her influence. Oh, yeah, and it's all produced by her too. Um, Janet Jackson, as I see that. Kate Bush. Um, is, what you call any queries? Da, da, da. So, yeah, definitely check it out. One of my favorite albums to date. Um, again, this is definitely my favorite track. Track number two, Can You Look In The Mirror. It's a fucking bop. I've been playing it all weekend, basically, in the gym on repeat. Absolutely amazing flipping album. Fabiana Palladino, self-titled. Check it out. Definitely one of my album of the year contenders, without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Ten tracks, all fucking bangers. No fucking skips. Big up Fabiana Palladino. Big up Fabiana Paladino, we love it. We love to see it. Actually, actually do because you know I'm a big fan of pop. I want to see great pop stars break out and create great music. I want to see them perform. Like I'm really good to see what she's like live. I'm eager to see if she sounds like a fucking CD or if she's one of those people that kind of you know relies on the fucking you know auto tune and shit. But I think looking at her, she's gonna be fucking incredible live. I'm assuming it's gonna be a lot of power coming out of that little lady. So I cannot wait to see her live. I'm not gonna lie, I cannot wait to see her fucking live. Big up. Fabiana Palladino. Moving on. So, um, I've shared some of my thoughts before about the J. Cole thing, and I want to share them again because I'm still perturbed by the whole situation. It's still fucking confusing me and still made me a bit upset, especially judging by how much of a big fan I am of his. So, I need to get this off my chest in general. So, I'm sure most of you know 
J. Cole got up on stage during his um, Dreamville Festival and basically apologized to Kendrick Lamar for dissing him back, even though Kendrick Lamar dissed him first. So let's actually play the clip and then I'm going to give you some of my thoughts and opinions about it and why this is so disappointing being a big J. Cole fan myself and just in general being a fan of hip hop and wanting to see these artists spar in a friendly way so that we'd get the best quality music. Um, let's see what J. Cole had to say. So I'm so proud of that project except for one part. It's one part of that shit that make me feel like, man, that's the lamest shit I ever did in my fucking life, right? And I know this is not what a lot of people wanna hear. I know I can hear my niggas up there right now like, nah, nah, I don't do that, but I gotta keep it 100 with y'all, right? Don't keep it 100. I damn near have keep a relapse, yourself. right? Jesus Christ. Because y'all heard some shit that happened two, two, three weeks ago, however long it was. Y'all, y'all, y'all heard that bazooka that was dropped on the motherfucking game, right? So all of this time of me moving on my own accord, for the first time I was tested. Why am I tested? Cause I got the world, and I got my niggas like, what you gonna do, Cole? <laughs> my niggas like, look how scared he boy, looks. I must have had a look thousand how scared calls. he looks, oh, man. My fucking God. God damn it! Dude. Text flooded. I couldn't even answer my shit. Nigga, it's war time. Boom, 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 right? Niggas want to see blood. And, and I was conflicted because, one, I know my heart, you know what I mean? And, like, I know how I feel about my peers, these two niggas that i just been blessed to even stand beside in this game, let alone chase, chase their greatness, right? So I felt conflicted because I'm like, bro, I know I don't really feel no way. But the world want to see blood. I don't know if y'all can feel that, but the world want to see blood. Oh, it does. So I say want to see good to say, music. want to see good sparring. In my spirit of trying to like get this music out, God I ain't going to lie to y'all. I moved in a way that was, that I feel spiritually feel bad on me. Like, like I try to like jab my nigga back and I try to keep it friendly. But at the end of the day, when I listen to it and when it comes out and I see the talk, that shit don't sit right with my spirit. That shit make me feel, that shit disrupts my fucking peace. So what I want to say right here tonight is in the midst of me doing that and, and in that Christ. shit, trying to find a little angle and downplay this, this nigga's fucking uh, catalog and his greatness. I want to say right now tonight, how many people think Kendrick Lamar is so one of cringe. the greatest motherfuckers that ever touched so the fucking microphone? So cringe. What? Dreamville, y'all love Kendrick Lamar, correct? As do I. So I just want to come up here and be like, publicly be like, bruh, that was the lamest, like, goofiest shit. And it make, I say all that to say, it made me feel like 10 years ago when I was moving incorrectly. And I pray that God align me back up on my purpose and on my path. You know what I mean? I pray that my nigga really didn't feel no way. And if he did, my nigga, I got my chin out. Don't hurt me. Shot, mm. take that shit the chin, boy. Do what you do. You know what I mean? Like, all good. Like, it's, it's love. So, the reason why this is so disappointing is that in my opinion, I don't even think the Kendrick Lamar verse on like that on the fucking Metro and Future album was that vicious to be this scared. Because if that track was vicious in that it really went at Drake and J. Cole and anybody else, then I can understand why he'd have these reservations after dropping quite a tentative kind of clapback. But I don't think it was that vicious really. If anything, there's an argument to be had for if Drake and J. Cole both ignored that verse and just continued on, yes, to some hip-hop purists out there, maybe myself included, they might have lost, lost some points because they didn't clap back or reply, but it, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It really wouldn't. If they both would have just pretended like it didn't happen and just kept it moving, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Because we've said it before, like, you know, the Drake thing, it's not as if Drake only has to go back at fucking... Kendrick he also has to basically get back at Rick Ross he has to get back at Future he has to get back at Travis Scott maybe even Nav right he's got a long list of people to get through in that you know in the fucking back in the hullabaloo of all that Kendrick stuff a lot of people have basically chose sides quote-unquote so he has to kind of get out a lot of people and he hasn't really clapped back directly in a long time if unless you want to count the stuff he did that fucking you know um red dot laser whatever that that laser beam fucking song is with him and J. Cole um so it's surprising that J. Cole is so scared because that's what I get from this mostly. I get from this apology from J. Cole 
is just fear. Like he's really worried at, at the prospect of what Kendrick Lamar could say back to him, which is to me the complete opposite of hip hop. Because if somebody disses you, it doesn't really matter if they win. You have to just spar back. You have to just display and demonstrate your, you know, lyrical ability. It's not really about you winning or not. Yes, obviously it hurts if you lose. I get it. But it's more so about you being there. It's like battle rap. It's the same thing too. Battle rap, the biggest sin in battle rap is mostly if you fluff your line and you forget your lines, which is equivalent to him saying sorry. No one really kind of gets too crazy if you lose, you know, it's a clean sweep and you lose all three rounds. It can happen. There are great MCs and rappers all around the world that could probably tear the heads off of some of our favorite battle rappers in the world. It kind of is what it is. But at least you tried. At least you put your fucking, at least you were in the fucking Coliseum sparring with the next guy. If your head gets chopped off, it is what it is. But it's the fact that J. Cole has waved the white flag before Kendrick can even reply. And after he replied back with the most soft, softest, I thought at the time, it was a precursor to a really heavy diss. So I was happy with it. Plus, hearing J. Cole kind of put put sowing seeds in the heads of hip-hop fans around the world by questioning Kendrick Lamar's discography and it turning into a big debate was actually quite fun because we all know deep down Kendrick Lamar is fucking great. He's one of the greats. He's got m maybe a flawless discography. But to have J. Cole, a legit rapper, a legit artist in the scene, put sows a, sowing seeds of doubt in your head by telling you, oh, one of these, you know, the second one was a flop. This one was a this, this one was a that. It was a quite a fun time. I'm not going to lie. This past couple of days. And obviously, J. Cole wasn't the most, um, he wasn't the one that got the most vitriol from Kendrick on that, like that tune anyway. So the fact that he would come out and clap back at Kendrick before Drake did, it gave a lot of bonus points. Even if it was tentative, even if it was a little bit, you know, comatose, it was a little bit shy, it was a little bit scary. At least he did it. He gained, he, he gained a lot of bonus points off of that, especially doing it, packaging it with like a EP before you drop your album during your fucking festival. Sick. We're all rating it, right? Then he comes out and undoes all of that by getting on stage and publicly waving his fucking white flag. It's beyond pathetic because it shows that instead of, instead of demonstrating how much of a great lyricist he is he's way more scared about the prospect of kendrick revealing some secrets that he doesn't want out there i think i mentioned in a stream when i did a random show it makes me think this apology because of how immensely um private j cole is he doesn't want anybody to know anything about him that he doesn't put out there so if you're a rapper if you're an artist or if you're in the industry i'm sure there are things that you know about these people that the regular person doesn't know so he's probably more worried about Kendrick coming back and saying things about him and his private life or his friends past relationships maybe some secret child that he doesn't want to be put out there he's more worried about that so that's why he's trying to preempt the Kendrick reply you know appeal to his better nature kind of do the whole sympathy thing in the hope that that guy doesn't go in and kind of try and completely destroy him by saying something incredibly over the line quote unquote that's what it seems like, which again is completely anti-hip-hop to be that worried about somebody that you're willing to wave the white flag. It's fucking pathetic. It really fucking is. And it's unfair too to the fans like myself because it now taints your listener experience of J. Cole because he's doing it for his own mental health and all this nonsense, which again, I've said it previously before on this podcast that I think the whole mental health thing has been one of the worst things to happen to society in general. People basically self-diagnosing themselves um, with having mental health issues when it's just you going through a crisis of confidence, um, you going through a downtime you may be not being in the best of moods because you're eating like shit, you're sleeping like shit. Now it's all being fucking attributed to mental health and aligning with your spirit. And your, it's all this nonsense, waffle, wah, wah, soft ass shit that doesn't really need to be spoken about in public. Because if you are really going through some mental health issues and you are really struggling mentally, the last thing you want to do is start speaking about it, you know, on social media, online with random people who are going to give you random, you know, um, random information, random feedback that is completely, um, you know, that doesn't have any relevancy to what you're going through. That's almost destructive. That doesn't really help you. It, you wouldn't do that. So this whole conversation is fucking kaput and I absolutely hate it. And this is what we're kind of seeing now. We're seeing the results of this, you know, self-diagnosis culture with this guy basically inventing all these reasons why he shouldn't be going back at Kendrick and making it seem like he's a threat to his life. It's like, bro, 
his fucking record or his feature on that Metro track and future track wasn't that fucking vicious. Your reply back to him was the softest, most fucking, you know, wearing helmets while you do boxing type of affair ever. It really isn't that deep. Just write your raps, record your disc record back, stand toe to toe with fucking Drake and go from there. And if you're Drake, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel if you're Drake? You've just been on tour. You've had j cole come out and do a series of dates with you during your tour you've been very grateful for his friendship um you know both personally and i guess career wise you've given him his flowers on stage you've you know basically he's made it known i guess in some way shape or form that he's team drake even though he's also caught with kendrick and now suddenly he's here waving a white flag what does this mean does this mean that j cole is also team kendrick also I don't know, but either way, it's incredibly disappointing. And the sad thing is about it is that if you listen to J. Cole's recent, the, the EP, the little thing that he just dropped, right? Might delete later. The really sad thing is that the, al the EP, the album, whatever, it's really good. There's actually a track on there called 3001. That's a couple of direct calls before the seven minute drill. That might be one of his best, you know, demonstrations of rap in a while in terms of a track. Like he's absolutely skating across that entire fucking record. So that's all lost now. That's all forgotten because of the seven, seven minute drill, you know, was the one that got everyone's attention. And now because of this fucking dumbass apology, you can't look at him the same way anymore. And, you know, people are now blaming Ariana Lennox for this because he obviously um, hangs out with her a lot. And she's somebody that's very in tune with her emotions and whatever it may be. People are blaming the fact that he's not really involved, like he's not an active artist in terms of dropping all the time he's done a lot of features obviously in the last you know 18 months or so but in terms of projects he's been a bit mia so maybe this is all on purpose maybe the fact that he is quite private and he does kind of moves a bit of his own drum maybe he doesn't enjoy actually partaking in like the helter skelter mainstream beef whatever thing he doesn't want to do it he just wants to be left alone to do his own thing but then the funny thing is or the interesting or the annoying thing is that he wants to do that but then when he gets on records he's always reminding you of just how great of an mc he is and how no one could touch him with this malarkey and i'm wondering to myself now like can does he have the right to say that anymore does j cole have the right to ever talk about how amazing a rapper he is when he was given the opportunity to spar on the best rappers in the world or uh, in current in in current times and he chose to wave his white flag can you ever talk with that level of bass in your voice anymore now that we know you wave the white flag is that even possible i personally don't think so so he's basically fucked his career because he was afraid of a reply a momentary reply that probably wouldn't have really st stood the test of time like most disrespectful records especially nowadays even if it did expose certain things so what the new cycle only lasts about a week if that what was really damaging like what is what is he actually scared of it can't be just the words it has to be what the words are it has to be but still very disappointing being a kendrick being sorry being a j cole fan and if anything now we know what kendrick was talking about when he says fuck the big three it's just big me that's what he meant because on one side you got drake who's incredibly popular um and probably somebody who probably doesn't feel like he owes kendrick a reply doesn't want to he doesn't even seem like he's scared he just doesn't he just doesn't give a fuck he's making too much money he's selling out arenas he's on tour his music always when it drops it doesn't you know crazy amount of numbers first week people love him he just doesn't care anymore you know what i mean um this kind of battle stuff is mostly like a backpacker hip-hop head type of thing like i'm into but in the grand scheme of things no one really actually probably cares that's why he probably doesn't care but in the kendrick side of things so in the j cole side of things he clearly does care he's an mc he's a rapper he's a rapper's rapper i think out of the all three of them i'd probably say j cole's probably the best all-round rapper of the all three if you had to kind of you know rate them so he definitely knows what's on the horizon when Jake when Kendrick does get back into the booth. But I don't know, man. I found it really disappointing. It was really saddening to see. And if anything, it's a reminder that hip hop has unfortunately changed for the worst. And it's never going to go back now. I think most of these artists are comfortable. They're making tons of money. They've got incredible levels of fame. They don't need to do anything, you know? And when anybody is required and whenever somebody requests them to do something kind of outside of their remit they are always going to turn it down because it's not comfortable because it's not easy um because it's not the thing that's the lowest hanging fruit they'd much rather just do that and i can understand why again i'd prefer it if that wasn't the case because in my head i thought this battle the really good thing about it would be this wouldn't be the disc records it'd be the fact that it would push each artist's pen it would push kendrick's pen 
to be as vicious as possible. It pushed Kendrick and, Jay and Drake's pen to have a good enough clap back that people will say, oh, they're actually pushing, you know, or keeping up with Kendrick because everyone thinks Kendrick is the fucking best rapper ever. It would have been great for us fans. We would have got the best music. We would have got the best verses. It would have been fucking awesome. And these guys are rubbing us off it because they're just too rich and famous. This is basically where we're at. They're too rich and famous to beef. They can't be bothered. So they'd rather just wave the white flag. And us fans get left, you know, now wondering what we do. Like imagine all the J. Cole fans that were out on social media defending seven minute drill. Because when it initially dropped, everybody was quite underwhelmed. But then Ken, you know, J. Cole fans had to like you know, convince themselves that seven minute drill was a worthy enough reply. It was good, it was great, even though, you know, J. Cole sounded like he didn't really want to do it on a track. Even from the first fucking verse, he sounded like he didn't want to be there. And then all of a sudden you're trying to defend it. People are trying people are coming around to the idea, okay, cool, it's true. Maybe J. Cole was right about him being overrated and you know his albums weren't that good. Maybe he's right. And then the next day, literally the next day, J. Cole comes out on stage and says, I'm sorry, Kendrick. <laughs> like, it must be so horrible being a being a J. Cole fan. You're defending him all, this whole weekend, fighting for your lives, and your fucking hero comes out and says, Kendrick, I'm sorry. Kendrick, I apologize. Kendrick, lo siento. Kendrick, this... <laughs> Oh, honestly, man, I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. What a shocking state of affairs. Really shocking state of affairs. But again, no surprise, hip-hop has completely changed for the worse, unfortunately. And now we've got all these soft-ass actions. We've got people online co-signing it. You've got Charlemagne talking his nonsense about mental health and all this. And it's like, no, this isn't the time to peddle all that shit. This is just a... And the thing about this is more frustrating, too, to end it. These guys don't have any street beef. Even though Kendrick has said some foul things insinuating about people, this is not street stuff. There's no goons involved. There's no fucking, you know, whatever. It's just three guys who are all at the top of the game trying to compete to see who's number one, number one for real when it comes to spitting. It's not even a fucking street thing. So the threats of all that stuff is completely off the table. So the fact that, you know, J. Cole got on stage looking that scary, looking that rattled, was really odd because it's not a street thing no one's no one's looking for anybody in real life and you know, from that free it's just like come on it's just a nonsense but i guess you know he did what he needed to do for his spirituality for his peace of mind um which is fucking crazy to admit on stage that you know kendrick lamar is giving you fucking uh he's giving you nightmares like and um, you know it's wild to admit another man's giving you nightmares but i guess if it's happening it's happening in it you can't deny it you can't just ignore it you have to kind of just recognize it and kind of go from there but again i'm disappointed i'm disappointed but what can we do what can we do moving on we've got this really sad clip this really sad picture this really sad state of affairs that is a real confirmation for all of us out there that the adidas samba hype is well and truly over it, reach, it, it features none other than UK Prime Minister Richie Sunak wearing a, you know, strategically wearing a pair of Adidas Sambas, white ones, with his trousers and his white shirt. It's basically the quintessential business casual. It's the quintessential smart casual. It's the quintessential Friday night in the office with the lads fucking outfit, right? If you worked in any sort of like office environment where you have to wear smart clothes, usually the Fridays where people kind of, you know, loosen a tie or don't wear a tie or don't wear a blazer and wear the trainers with their fucking suit. And that looks like what he's done here. So it's, so, it's obviously strategically done, but this is the proof if ever you needed it, that the final nail in the coffin has been done with Sambas. The Samba nail in the coffin wasn't all those kids in central London, Soho, wearing their massive jeans and their oversized jackets and pretending to smoke cigarettes and shit and taking a million fucking street style pictures of themselves. No, those weren't the kids that killed Sambas. Not even Jound, made in Germany, oops, made in Vietnam, Sambas didn't kill fucking the Sambas. Not even JD Sports killed the Sambas. Not even Size, right? Not even Offspring. No one. The ones that killed the fucking Sambas was when the normies got a hold of them. When your regular Beckys and Emmas, which I saw a couple actually the other day. I saw a Becky and Emma um, on the central line actually. And this girl looked like she had legitimately like a US nine foot, like a UK nine, like a men's UK nine foot. And if you know anything about Sambas, you know the, the svelte slim profile makes them look really big. If you've got a big foot like me, I'm a US what? I'm a US 12, US 11. So my feet always look fucking gigantic everywhere, especially because I've got wider feet. So when you see a girl that's got really long feet wearing shoes that are really hard to pull off, if you have really long feet, 
It's like, oh my God. And also she was wearing it with some Zara dress. I was like, okay, cool. The Ayla Samba hype is dead. But this is definitely the confirmation that we need that Sambas are officially over. If you wear a pair of Sambas now, I pray for you. But it's done. Richie Sunak has got a pair. The fucking lamest, dorkiest guy in the world is wearing a pair of shoes that everyone's kind of creaming over. I can't do it. I can't. So that's why going forward, the only Sambas I'm going to be wearing are the fucking Jown Sambas. I'm going to pay, you know, $400 to wear a pair of fucking Jown. Let's actually see how much they're going for on StockX. But that's the only thing I'm going to do now. No more Sambas for me, GR ones. Only the fucking Jown ones because they've got a bit more extra quality on them because I can't be buying those fucking other shitty ones and getting myself in fucking trouble by looking like fucking Richie Sunak. Imagine going to a pub or going out and someone's like, oh shit, you got the Richie Sunaks? Are those the shoes that Richie Sunak has? He's like, fuck off, you know what I mean? I would not take that well. So a pair of jowned Aida Sambas, which are a little bit more luxe. Um, they're allegedly made in Germany, but they're actually made in Vietnam. They're actually going for 300 and what? $300. Let's actually see my size. My size, the last sale was oh jesus christ a lot my size the last sale was um god damn 367 or let's say because if it's a bit narrow i'd probably get a 11.5 no oh sorry i'd probably get a 10.5 yeah so 367 god damn it 367 to get a pair of ada sambas that are made in much nicer materials than the one that richie Sturak is wearing and they're way more expensive they're retailing for or not retailing but you know reselling for about 300 400 dollars which is crazy because those are just the normal ones, right? And that's another type of thingy. But yeah, absolutely wild to see um, crazy scenes overall. But again, the Adidas Samba hype is over, my friends. The Adidas Samba hype is officially over. I apologize. I really fucking do apologize. Moving on from that, moving on. We have news here courtesy of Hype Never Dies regarding Denim Tears' new Kiss My Grits Drop Free collection, which is going to be dropping later on uh, this week. Um, it features some of their stuff that I've already told you about, I think, on the podcast before, regarding some of their watermelons-themed things. But there's also the addition of a pair of shorts, jean shorts, with the cotton reef design on them. So if you're wondering if the cotton reef design is going to die anytime soon, the introduction of these jean shorts here, cotton reefs, should be the clear indication for you that the cotton reef design isn't going anywhere anytime fucking soon. Um, I actually see a picture here on Tremaine Emery's actually Instagram account. If you click on this picture here, you can actually see what they look like on person. And they actually look quite decent on this model, but it's obviously a model. And he's obviously very skinny, so he obviously makes it look way better than what they actually look like. And he's also teamed it up with the socks, and he's got this really nice top on. But I don't know. This is maybe an indication that the cotton reefing might be played out and over. It's gone from jeans, sweats, and now we've got jean shorts. What next? Is he going to make fucking bikinis with a cotton reef? It's never ending. So there's going to come a point in time, similar to what happened to um, Needles with the track with the track pants. You remember, there was a time when everybody was wearing these fucking Needles. I've actually, I think I actually have a pair actually in my cupboard somewhere. I have a purple one. But there was a point in time where everybody was wearing these Needles track pants with every fucking look they had. They were the most ubiquitous thing you'd ever see. Everyone had a pair of these Needles track pants, right? Everyone had a pair of these. Really expensive, by the way. And if I remember correctly, the Needles brand, um, they were getting upset because everybody just wanted the track pants. No one wanted a track jacket. So at one point, they tried to sell, they tried to only sell the pants with a suit, with a jacket. So you had to buy it as a suit. But obviously, people protested and people didn't want to fuck with it. So they had to go back to selling them separately. But they must have a, they must have a, gigantic surplus of just jackets that no one buys because everyone wants a pants so that being said i feel like those pants were the precursor to the denim tears um cotton reef design and i feel like there's gonna come a point where people are gonna get really tired of this design which is already probably happening already um let's look the <laughs> yeah exactly look at the person in this comment someone says yeah i wish they came distressed like in the picture Oh, I always said dress, okay. Any idea how the sizing is? Shorts hard, but the top is so crazy. The sign reminds me of the film City of Gods. Um, but yeah, that's the new drop that's meant to be arriving very, very soon, courtesy of Denim Tears. There's actually more detail of it actually available here, courtesy of the Instagram account that features more of the stuff that's available. So you've got some T-shirts, you've got a hoodie with, I think, is that a tomato design or something? You've got KMG, which is, I guess, Kiss My Grits on the um, hoodies in this college font. You've got a 
almost baseball y type version of the sweatpants with the pinstripes. You got the sweatpant, you got the okras, um, baseball jersey also there. You got the gingham hat that also says kiss my grits, shirt and a bag and a tote. You've also got the denim, the cotton reef denim shorts. You got them in light. You got a black denim, white, and also selvage. And then you've also got one of my favorite shirts. Actually, I really like this shirt. This shirt here that features all the vegetables that black people like to eat: or okra, watermelon. Is that banana? There's a banana. Is that banana? A sweet corner. I thought you said it's a banana. That'd be hilarious. And it's also got okra snapbacks hat. No, okra new era hats available also. Um, but the funny thing is, checking their Instagram. The comment section on Dead in Tears is fucking brutal because it's a constant reminder that the only thing people want from Dead in Tears, weirdly enough, is the fucking, um, is the jerseys, is this, the Cotton Reef shit. But the Cotton Reef stuff is getting played out. Look at this Dead in Tears baseball team thing. I guess it's real, Dead in Tears sports. I guess there's some, I guess there's a really long history, I'm assuming, especially with the Negro League, with black people, American, African-American people in America, with it, with it baseball and sports in general. But this baseball outfit with the cotton reef thing is fucking awful. It's so bad. Like, I would not see being seen dead and something like that. This looks fucking terrible, right? They've all got the, they've all basically got cotton, you know, baseball jerseys um, that features the cotton reef um, design all over it. And I personally think they're absolutely, it looks absolutely unbearable, almost nauseating how bad this shit is. Um, and again, a signifier that things are about to end very soon when it comes to this sort of stuff. And if you go back to Instagram, you go through the comment section, you'll see here um, that people are basically only asking for the reef stuff. And this person saying, holy brick, we need a restock on the sweats again and lower the prices like 158 top 148, thanks. People are probably never going to get the Kiss My Grits reference is hard. Another one says, need the shorts. Now you got to chill for real. I don't know if you'd be trolling or what. This is a little crazy. Another one says, shorts and a jersey on the way. We need the best shorts. The shorts aren't Levi's. Another person says, open mouth. So a lot of the comments on here aren't the kindest. They're not the most flattering when it comes to what they've been doing and shit um which i wonder what he has to say about this sort of stuff when he sees it um you click another picture there as well about the shorts someone says they fell off hard i was just gonna cut my jeans and that one says cut cook out jaws how's the sizing i wish i could afford your stuff so not the best replies on stuff when it comes to the stuff he puts out i'm not gonna lie it's kind of wild them shorts about to do will chamberlain numbers I was happy to meet you and explain the drawings in person. The hat is something serious. Took the album, took the almond brothers. Eat it, okay, whatever for cross summer plays it. Bloody blah blah blah. So I'm curious to see what he does do going forward because it feels like the cotton reef design is kind of played out. So I'm curious to see will he evolve it or will he just keep you know re remixing it and re put you know doing some twist here and there and re putting it out or is there a need to kind of evolve or do you just keep running the thing that you do in the ground in the hope it kind of takes off this shoot was really funny by the way this features um the kiss my grits collection modeled by some asian folks for the pop-up shop they have in seoul which is hilarious when you think about you know the fact that the Tears is meant to be a quote-unquote black experience brand and then they go and put the same clothes on asian people is absolutely hilarious but hey I guess Asian people also like okra, I'm assuming, right? Asians probably like okra just as much as black. So maybe it makes a lot of sense. Maybe it makes a lot of sense. There's actually another one here with the Asian dude. He actually looks really cool, the model himself that's wearing all the stuff, but it's just hilarious to have the model, you know. The black, I think someone said it actually in the comments, they 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 found the blackest looking model and obviously put him in a watermelon <laughs> hoodie. Absolutely hilarious absolutely hilarious someone says in the comments um ain't no niggas in seoul i like it but seoul makes zero sense could have did south africa liberia even london would have made more sense but we know why he went to seoul right he probably went to seoul because the money was good most likely which is funny so you have this you know black experience brand you know fist in the air black panther type of stuff but then you also go where the money tells you to go maybe there's a deeper darker story behind this but i find that quite hilarious right to be that politically and socially motivated but then go wherever the money tells you is absolutely hilarious especially when it doesn't fucking link up with what you're doing but you know what better than nothing better than nothing and again maybe it will evolve and develop let's see what he does let's see what he does
Moving on from that one, we've got this um, article here, courtesy of New York Times, which I actually did find through Tremaine's profile, actually. So big up him for posting it. It says here, Virgil Abloh's legacy is about to get louder. Um, Shannon Abloh and the Fashion Scholarship Fund unveiled a new plan. So this features a new article written by Vanessa Friedman, highlighting Shannon Abloh and um, Virgil's wife here on the right hand side and a new initiative to kind of spearhead and I guess platform minority voices within fashion because funnily enough, Everybody spoke a really big game um, during the fucking, you know, riots and during the protests, during the lockdown, during COVID about wanting to, you know, um, what you call it, diversify the hires in fashion, in design, in all these places and kind of, you know, um, have a little bit more inscrutivity in whatever it may be. And most of it, I think, was done in good faith. I don't think people were just saying diversify for the fact of diversity, diversity for the fact of diversity. I think a lot of it was mostly, hey, we need different voices. We need different faces, different backgrounds in these positions. There's plenty of them there, but they never get hired. And obviously, because of the recent hires in fashion, all being white dudes in fashion houses, there definitely is a conversation need to be had about why is it always the same persons or the same type of people getting these jobs and there's not the diversity that these brands or these fashion companies like to always kind of you know talk about we see it in a runway we might see in the editorial but when it comes to how what they do behind the scenes it doesn't really work so i do like the fact that people like virgil when he was around rip to him and obviously samuel ross they have these charities set up where they prioritize platforming you know people from marginalized communities not just for the sake of you know here's a token fucking job more so of like hey i know you guys don't have access to this sort of stuff you don't have the visibility so i'm going to give you the visibility based on my celebrity based on my brand based on my platform and then hopefully once you get that platform you can then go and do good things so i like that that happens so let's see what virgil's doing here cursing for this a freedom on new york times it says many companies including fashion companies may be going silent about the diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives in the face of the political change the last round of major design appointments may have not included a single creative director of color but at the least one group is doubling down on its commitment to broadening the style talent pipeline at its inaugural gala on april 8th peter arnold the executive director of the fashion scholarship fund the non-profit that is dedicated to expanding access to industry for the underprivileged students and shannon abloh the widow of Virgil Abloh will unveil a new strategic plan for the Virgil Abloh Postmodern Scholarship Fund. The new initiative will double the number of recipients and expand the way the fund de defines support. Love it. As such, it marks the next step in Miss Abloh's efforts to consolidate her husband's legacy. Mr. Abloh, the pioneer and black designer who founded the brand Off White, collaborated with Nike and became the first black creative director of Louis Vuitton menswear, died in late 2021 of the rare form of cancer. Ra, it's been it's been already nearly three years fuck bro it feels like it just happened yesterday 2021 god damn r.i.p to the growth um when he became the successful virgil was the first black face that many kids saw in a the room they didn't know that they could they could enter miss abla said via zoom from chicago just before getting on a plane to new york for the fashion scholarship fund event he and i talked about how can we turn this into something that really means something over time the virgil abla postman scholarship fund was part of the answer I would be curious how many of Virgil's cool guy friends, the ones who were all begging it when he was around, I wonder how many of them actually turned up to this event, this gala. It's the first I've heard of it, but I wonder how many of his cool guy friends, the ones that were always kind of asking for fucking shoes, always asking for lists and entry at fucking shows, always asking for collab stuff to be put aside, always asking for discounts at Louis Vuitton. I wonder how many of his fucking cool guy friends were at this event. I wonder. Because I remember one of the most heartbreaking things about him when he passed away was, I think, Shannon Abloh, his wife, saying in some interview that bare people came up to her during the funeral and basically saying, oh, I'm Virgil's best friend. I'm his best friend. I'm in this. I'm his that. Um, you know, it kind of got a little bit, kind of, I would imagine it kind of probably felt a little bit much to all take. All these people that you don't know and haven't met you know, professing to be his best friend and basically trying to position themselves as like, oh, I'm the I'm the one that you should be talking to type of thing. Very bizarre. But anyway, we move. It says now she said of the DEI reversals. It's really nerve wracking seeing the changes that are happening. But for me, all it means is that the work needs to be continued to be louder. It makes it, 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 it just makes it just makes me double down and say, OK, we need to fight harder. But that's the thing. The problem I think it happened. It's not really usually an equality of like outcome. It's equality of opportunity. That's the thing that I think they fucked up on. I think all that diversity shit was good. But I think a lot of it was mostly, OK, let's just get 
black faces in there, even if they're useless, just to mix things up. And I don't think that's the right way to go about things. I think what you need to do is you need to, uh, uh, you know, allow access to these type of things to everybody. That's real diversity. And that's when you're definitely going to get far better product, far better, you know, whatever experiences, whatever for the customer at the end of it. But they didn't do that. They just did the easiest thing, which is hire a bunch of black people. Um, the darker, the better, the more quote unquote weird looking, the better. Just to kind of tick some boxes and make it look like you're actually doing the work when actually behind the scenes you're not. And the cultures around the company are still fucked up. So definitely equality of opportunity, which is also impossible. I understand in some regards, but when it comes to fashion, unfortunately, like there's no excuse. You go to fashion shows outside inside the show it's a fucking smorgasbord of nationalities and races people from all over the world all shapes and sizes all colors and creeds so it's really odd when the fashion shows themselves and the, the people around it who love it are from all over the place but then when you go behind the scenes at certain magazines or certain brands it's very whitewashed it's just odd it's an odd balance you know what i mean in my opinion but hey what do i know Founded in 2020 by Mr. Abloh with a $1 million of seed capital, the Virgil Abloh Postmodern Scholarship Fund is administered by the Fashion Scholarship Fund. In February 2022, just after Mr. Abloh's death, it received the first major injection of funds thanks to a post homeless auction of 200 pairs of Mr. Abloh's designs that raised $18 million. Wow. God damn it, bro. I don't think there's ever going to be someone else that could raise that amount of money from just shoes that they designed. Obviously, it was obviously post his death, but... 18 million from 200 pairs but i think a lot of them were also louis vuitton collabs so they go for crazy amounts anyway which allowed miss abloh and fss to rethink the scholarship fund and what it can do redressing in the sorry readdressing in inequity inequity is a long and long long game that requires a consistent investment over time mr arnold said this amount of money that thank you virgil came to us allows us to weather some of the moments when other people are not so committed as you would expect them to be oh exactly miss ablo uh, miss ablo who's remained in the background when her husband was alive has only begun to speak out recently will be making one of her rare public appearances at the gala to announce a new plan with her will be her children low 11 and gray eight who will be seeing their mother step into the spotlight for the first time they're starting to really ask a lot more questions about what i'm doing she says they're also going to touristy things such as seeing the wicked on broadway beyond simply expanding the number of grants recipients to 60 next year the rebound scholarship fund will involve a new bridge fund that will look at costs beyond tuition the fsf the fsf had discovered had some students who received scholarship could not afford to accept it um, some some have to work, Miss Abloh says. They can't quit their job and go to school. There was a student whose laptop broke and she couldn't afford to replace it, so we're going to drop out of school. There was someone who got a great internship at Milan but couldn't afford a flight. That's not okay, said Miss Abloh. In addition, the um, the fashion scholarship fund is an engineering ways to reach out to students who are not in traditional art school track, including connecting with community colleges. Mr. Abloh himself studied architecture and had no formal fashion education. Finally, the fund is leaning on the extended network of Ms. Abloh's friends to mentor grant recipients beyond the initial one year period of scholarships. The quote. When students are going into their first job, I think it's really important that they have an advocate or mentor that they can learn on, they can lead on, sorry, to give them ideas and support. I had dinner with a handful of Virgil's friends last week, probably 20, which is a fraction of the friends and artists and musicians and DJ and people run their own clothing brands. They're all alike and say word and we're ready to help. Mr. Arnold said that the group included the designer Tremaine Emery and stylist Gabriella Caffera Johnson, who also herself is an FSF recipient. Virgil was impatient, says Miss Ablo. He liked to move fast so he could have be ready for this to happen. It was always like, how can we can affect the most students in the biggest way possible? Beyond the Virgil Abloh Postmodern Scholarship Fund, Miss Ablo is finalizing plans for the Virgil Abloh Foundation, which she expects to introduce later this year. The goal will be providing an access and opportunities to young people, just as the VAPM does but in a slightly different way in 20 years i want the young kids who are interested in creative arts to find virgil the foundation will f provide a way for them to see his work and to have access to what he created it's also a, a, for our own children who she said were so young when his father passed i look at it as something that they will be able to dive into really learn for his dad on the outside house i know he would be super super proud she said um then she correct herself is super proud 
Big up, man. RIP to Virgil. Um, fucking tragic situation, but at least his wife is obviously keeping his legacy alive. And this fashion fun thing is looking really fucking cool as well. Fashion scholarship fun. So if you're interested in it, you know where to find the information. Do your Googles and find out. And RIP to the goat. RIP to the blood clot goat. Moving on, we have to talk about this. 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 So, I've heard that there's a new nightclub opening up in Amsterdam called Tillatech, which is actually going to be housed in the former The School building, which I'm really upset that I didn't get a chance to go to. Um, the School was this incredible nightclub in Amsterdam that was in a former school, um, as the name would suggest, which offers up interesting acoustic opportunities. Um, I know this because I remember there was a period of time in London where everybody was involved in this sort of like property management sort of thing essentially what happened is that before 2019 before the pandemic maybe even 2017 2015 there was a period in time where people were basically renting these amazing spaces because there was a surplus of buildings available in london that were in the process of being knocked down or renovated and shit so these property developing management companies got together and basically were renting out these buildings for the period in time between it took from the building to start so you could be living in an office you know one floor of an office to yourself for like a year but then the obviously the issue was that you'd have to move around quite a lot because the building work once the building work started you have to kind of leave the site but you got a chance to live in these amazing weird spaces for a fraction of regular rent prices so i remember this one particular place i went to they had a party there and these people lived in a primary school i think it was like in northwest london it was like in a primary school and it's like an old you know 80s built primary school loads of wood flooring everywhere loads of brick loads of big you know high what you call it high ceilings loads of natural light and honestly i honestly swear to god raving in that place when the person's house party and then just having a couple of speakers active monitors at the front i don't think i've heard a better sound system in my life because imagine this sound was bouncing all around like a disco hall like, kind of like a like a assembly hall wooden floors think of like you know high school type of affair the sound was so incredible so I could only imagine what it was like raving in the school with a proper sound system and it's in the form of school. Anyway, um, luckily for us, myself included, um, you know, techno tourists included, the school isn't getting knocked down. They're not knocking it down and turning it into horrible, you know, glass and steel fucking skyscraper that has a shitty coffee shop at the bottom and loads of co-working spaces. No, they're going to keep the building, but the school's not running anymore. It's going to be another group of people who are also in charge of this bar in Amsterdam called Pamela, um, which is not to be confused with Paloma in Berlin, but there's this um, queer bar in Amsterdam called Pamela that a lot of people kind of rate so the team behind this are the one that are opening uh that are going to take over from the school under the name of Tillatech. so they're going to be running it as well so there's an article here courtesy of a mix mag that kind of delves into it and there's also a clip I want to play from the founders of um Pamela in Amsterdam who've taken over the school and now calling it Tillatech to kind of get an understanding of what they're going to be like and what their vibe is so the article that kind of you know um, gives indication what's going on it says a new nightclub is set to open within the former house of Amsterdam's the school Tillatech set to open its doors on April 12th it's said to be the joint project between Samuel King and DJ Lola Edu the founder of Queer Bar Pamela according to the translated article by Dutch publication Het Parol or Het Parol um, the project has provisional license lease date ending April April two thousand. Oh man. Okay, cool. So April two thousand twenty-five is when the lease ends. I wonder if that means when it's going to get knocked down. But anyway, for the time being, it's going to be open. Edo shared the news on Instagram writing so proud to finally be able to tell you that we're opening a new place always being my wish to make the city a bit more interesting with my experience so you scroll down um, you also got resident advisor reports the project will be a multidisciplinary space hosting a restaurant workshops alongside club nights Tiller Tech will have a capacity of around 900 visitors which is a perfect amount of people with rentable space of pop-ups exhibition spaces and more the venue formerly hosted Amsterdam's beloved 700 capacity club the school was shot for good in January 2024, which I missed that party, by the way, I was meant to go, but, you know, long story on that one. The school occupied a converted school since 2016, functioning as a nightclub, concert venue, restaurant, cafe, and exhibition. Despite the now defunct nightclub story, tenure at its site, Teletext marketing director, Passino, what's that called? Passion Zienga. 
Okay, I love that name. Passion Zenga. Big up Passion the Zenga. Told Head Patrol that the new venue will also share the address with the school. The Zenga shared that the organizers um, plan to use the space in a different dynamic way. Um, and sometimes it's a restaurant or cafe and other times exhibition space and then a club. According to the Zenga, the Teletech hopes to provide a space for minorities, which is nice because I'm a minority, by the way. Hi, minority here. Especially queer people of color inside team that organizes themselves are part of these communities details have yet to be confirmed so that's great news then we also got news of the opening right courtesy of um their website so they actually they actually got dates here they're going to be open so they've obviously put a post here courtesy of the instagram on Tech. so the dates of the opening parties are going to be the, uh, the 12th of april 13th and 14th um, tickets available and look what happened once they dropped they dropped the tickets i think they gave like a secret link to people who signed up early and even when i looked at it it was already sold out but now look at it all of the dates are completely sold out so this is the power of i'm guessing um pamela and their collective of people within that co queer community in amsterdam and also probably the pull of the school and just the scene of rule because a lot of people have said to me over the years that i should definitely check out amsterdam i haven't been to amsterdam before i need to go um i tended to kind of not go to amsterdam or not be bothered because i'm not a big weed smoker so i thought you know if that's the only real thing to kind of go out there for i'm not really for it and the big festivals that they have out there they're a little bit too crazy for me to go to um you know the deck mantles of the world it's not really for me which is why i prefer to go to like a dre molen it's a little bit more eclectic a little bit more spaced out i feel like deck mantles are a bit more you know too packed so i never really you know made the effort to go but recently i've heard from a few people out there telling me that the amsterdam scene is actually better than the berlin scene people have actually said that with a straight face I, there was a time where somebody actually told me that the school is actually they think the school is actually a better club than Berghain, which is wild to think but somebody actually did say that with their chest somebody who i trust who i respect their opinion greatly so if they're saying that then i'm sure that this Tillotech place will definitely be just as good. It's in the same place. It's run by people who know what they're doing. Um, and already, as you can tell by the dates of these, you know, tickets that are meant to be dropping, they all sold out already. All fucking sold out. Friday, was it the Friday, the fucking Saturday and the Sunday, all fucking gone, which is absolutely incredible. Especially when you remember, if I'm not, if I'm not confused, that the lineup itself is actually, it's not one really that bait. I mean, I don't know. I don't recognize any of these names. Maybe I'm not really in the know. Um, we, apart from Roxy Moore, who I think might be from there. I'm not really too sure. But I don't really know, rec recognize a lot of the names they're going to be playing. You've got someone called Afro, Afro Kali, someone called Cheyenne, Hud Cheyenne Hudson, Diora, um, Eat Rabat, Haiti, Jaru, Justin Case, Kyra Kad Khalid, Khalid, Lola Idu, um, Larry, Liza retro immigration that's a fucking brilliant name isn't it retro immigration i love that one um someone called rosalie roxy moore soft break um tech lab vic sarah and zoe mcpherson so a lot of people i don't really even recognize so the fact that they were able to sell out all of those dates for the opening of this club with really unknown people is amazing fucking amazing 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 work so big up them for that but there is some good news because of the instagram actually they actually did say that there are going to be some tickets available um they said tickets on the opening of tech are available now somebody also asked them in the comments here to so pick up the person that asked the question appreciate you will you sell tickets on the door as well the pre-sale link did not work for me and you know I, I had some issues with it but it, it just generally sold out i think I, I got through one time where they were able to kind of hold the ticket but when i tried to pay it also didn't go through i just for people people just bought them all and obviously tier tech replied and said a limited amount of tickets will be available on wednesday at um 1 p.m uh, cst on twitter.com there'll be a limited amount of tickets on the door as well available so as per user in clubs i think as an as a kind of fyi to a lot of people out there in very rare occasions do club nights sell out and you can't get in it doesn't really happen unless everybody with a ticket turns up and then everybody queues up really early buys those tickets left over and then there's no one else there's no, no space left inside and there's one in one out but if you just arrive early before opening you should be okay and you know and on the day especially if it being a quote-unquote international club there'll be a bunch of people who bought tickets or flake last minute everybody always does this so keep an eye out on ticket web um or t no, ticket swap or whatever all those sites to get a, a ticket or maybe the fucking what you call it this actual site itself 
maybe the event ticks might have a resale fucking section that you could obviously buy tickets from but it's very rare occasions that i've seen in my life where i haven't been able to go to a rave as long as you got the money as long as you turn up early you can go for the most part of course there's obviously the aspect of picking and shit so you have to obviously make sure that you know you click with the vibe and whatever it may be and be lucky to be selected to get in but for the most part if you're if the if there's a will there's a way in my personal opinion anyway that being said I did do a bit of research online to kind of gather to find out, you know, what these guys are about and what their kind of perspective would be in terms of opening the club. And there is a really good interview with the two people who did found um, Pamela's in um, Amsterdam. And they talk about, you know, their perspective when it comes to nightlife, their perspective when it comes to opening a queer club in Amsterdam. And I think a lot of what this guy says in particular, I think is going to resonate with how Teletech is going to be when it opens up and the vibe in there. So if you're kind of curious to see what the people behind um, Pamela's or behind Teletech are like um, this interview here should give you a brief idea behind it and they kind of explain and expound on the ideas around you know why they opened Pamela in the first place and I think a lot of this stuff will go into what goes into well, I think that's fucking um, Teletech when it does eventually open let's play the clip here and this, this is an interview I think courtesy of uh, Pater as well I think Pater did like an interview series with links or something and they interviewed Pamela so you can find a whole clip on YouTube if you want as well but this is just a little clip that they speak about the background and why they opened the queer bar in the first place well I think that speaks a lot to who the space caters for you know uh, yeah I think we would like to speak a little bit more about this uh, space that you've been able to create here and how people can really be allies here because when you have queer spaces it is designed for the queer community and a lot of people would like to be allies how is the importance for you for a queer space to exist in the city and what experience have you had that made you want to create the space i personally had a uh experience where which i do, do explain to people quite a lot to explain what this space means is i was in a, in another bar and uh it was a straight bar and I was actually there on a date because obviously I'm not going to date someone in my own bar, <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately. So we were there and um, the date's going really well. He says that like it's obvious. He says that like it's obvious. I don't think it is. Uh, there's probably a lot of messy relationships and hookup culture within bars and clubs, I'd imagine. It's been a long time since I worked in a bar and the one I worked at you know, was just a fucking chain bar in terms of spoons and shit. But I'd imagine there is a lot of fucking hanky-panky with bartenders, especially in the club scene. It must be a thing. It must be a thing. It must be impossible to fucking resist. But it's probably weirder when you're the manager or you're the boss. You probably have to create some separation. That's, that's definitely a strange power imbalance, which people probably want to talk about, especially that's the thing that's really interesting. Within the, within the queer scene or even just the i'd like to deem it the kind of alternative from the mainstream dance music sort of nightlife scene there is a lot of like you know snobbery at the mainstream scene when they look down about how people act and behave in clubs but it's interesting that they have the same issues that the mainstream people have it's just it's just a consequence of nightlife i think you know as my parents always say nothing good really happens after 9 p.m so you know the worst of people comes out at night so it's just really hard to kind of you know, get away from those kind of messy situations. But I think if you're a manager or a boss, you probably have to be really strict not to fall in love with one of your barbacks. You know what I mean? Even though they might be in love with your life, you never know. But you have to be very cautious not to do it because if you do, it doesn't work out. It's going to be awkward for everybody in the club. Oh, I lean in and I uh, kiss the guy. And then all of a sudden I hear, oi. And we both jump and I turn around. I see the rest of the bars looking at us. It wasn't actually aimed at us, it was aimed at a bartender, but from that moment on, we felt no longer safe in that space. Mm. So we awkwardly just paid and left and went somewhere else. So then, then when I'm explaining it to people why we tried to keep the space queer is because these spaces are so limited, there aren't many of these spaces, that, for instance, if we didn't have a door policy and we allowed everyone that walked by, to go, uh, walked by to come in here, all of a sudden, say for instance, somebody else from any part of our community was in the bar, and there was, uh, it was predominantly dominated in here with straight people, then maybe they would get that same feeling that I had when I was in that bar. And that's a really good point that I'd never considered when it comes to queer spaces or queer parties, the need for it to be very much catered to their community because there's so little of them things available for them to go to 
But then the issue in, in in the UK, especially in London, we just don't have that culture of like door picking. It's just not a thing. It's recently become a thing. I think if anything, to be fair to them or to be fair, to be very, you know, um, to get my law and my history right. I honestly do think Fold were the main reason why door picking came back in. Because the main kind of selling point or the main propaganda or like promotion or marketing behind Fold when it first opened was the idea it was going to be 24 hour club, which it obviously wasn't because, you know, 24 hour licenses in London are kind of hard to come by and they have them periodically spread out throughout the year, but they still one of the only clubs to open until six. And the other thing about Fold when it first opened was that they build it as like a you know, as 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 all oh, the founders have taken all the lessons from all their experience around club land. They've learned about the clubs in fucking, you know, in Tbilisi. They've learned about the clubs in Berlin. They've learned about the Amsterdam scene. And they're going to put all that stuff back and kind of synthesize it all in this one space. And they're going to, you know, have door picking. It's going to be, I mean, that's that's how it kind of was reintroduced into the scene. So I think Fold was the one that kind of brought that back in. But it's still finding it difficult. Like people still complain about not being let in at Unfold, about being turned away at certain other you know, parties they have there. Like it's it's still a contentious thing. We just don't accept it too well. Um, I think in the continent, in Europe mostly, people do. People are comfortable with the idea of being turned. Not comfortable. People don't really get as irate or as angry as they do in England if you get turned away at a club. I think in London, even if it is a queer place that's predominantly for queer people or LGBTQ people or gay people, it's people are just going to find it really difficult to take if they have money and they turn up and you turn them away. But then I understand the need to protect that space because if you're building it, you made it specifically from a need, your own need, where you felt uncomfortable being in straight spaces and there's not many of them for you, then you do it. But then again, you know, it gets into a murky discrimination type of field, which is odd because by their very nature, members clubs are quite discriminatory, right? Um, but then if you pay for your membership, you kind of get in. It's, I don't know, it's, it's a weird gray area. But I think in general, the strictness that some of these club nights have in terms of who they let in and what they promote and where they put their parties and who does security for them, I feel like as annoying as it can be for punters myself included i think the fact that they're so strict with it and the fact that they're so anal about it for lack of a better term has been the best thing for it in general that's why the scene is so good now because all these raves all these parties all these collectives they take themselves so seriously and um, they really try to think of their community first they put them you know as the first priority they think about the normies and the general public and the straights after you guys can fuck off we're servicing our community and whatever they say goes type of thing and that's why they're all flourishing and doing great things in their own field but it can be hard to swallow when you're not part of the community because like hold on i just want to party i want to have a good time and then like no nah, like, i'm not gonna let you in it's a bit mad it's like when i went to it's when i went to berlin recently and i was turned away from that's the only place i got turned away from was roses it's this bar in kreuzberg which is a really lovely bar it's all red and shit inside it's like really upholstered right it's really amazingly and it's just it's just one of the one of the places i like to go to sometimes to have a drink and hang out and shit but it's also a gay bar um but usually i always get in and this one time i guess i just didn't get in and it was annoying because you know i rocked up by myself to go in and they said no and then the whole group of other guys come behind me and they say yes it's like okay what why do you say yes to me not to me do those guys look more gay than me is that why they get in and it's like and then it becomes a weird conversation in that respect because then you're going into it with a sense of entire entitlement and shit that you should get into everywhere you go in especially if you're not part of the community so it's a weird place to be but i i appreciate this explanation because it did make me kind of think about it in a different way like oh yeah that's true you know it is quite you know selfish to be like i want to get into everything when these guys can't have everything you know what i mean they have, to, they have to pick and choose where they can go but we can go anywhere so it's a weird thing but let's continue i love this in respect intro i love this explanation and for me then we've kind of lost the whole point of the bar because it was supposed to give you a space to feel completely that you didn't need to worry about like if you're with someone that you're going to hold their hand and is that safe for me to do here can i are we sitting too close can i kiss this person here i just wouldn't want that the whole point of this actually very small bar it's this one small space in amsterdam that we could have for ourselves and uh I think that definitely, like, it doesn't exclude our allies coming in here. We I wonder if you could do that with, like, a black bar. Like, I eventually do want to open up my own club. Eventually, I will open my own club. But I wonder, 
if I decide to open up a, a space like that, that, you know, for cool black people in London and shit, which we don't have a lot of, right? We rarely, we have club nights and shit. We don't have like a one bar where you can go in and they're going to be playing sick music and shit. And you know, you know, on the week, like for instance, like, I've always thought to myself, like, why can't I go out to a place in London where I know I'm going to hear the latest hip hop album that just dropped, right? It's not the only thing I listen to, but if I want to listen to this new fucking future and Metro Boomin joint album again, I want to know that on that weekend, if I go to this bar, they're going to be playing that shit on loop. Do you know what I mean? They're going to be slapping that shit. And that, that should be quite cool, but we don't have one. Um, I wonder if you could do that. Obviously, it wouldn't be blacks only. That would be fucking wild. But it would be a heavily black influence club or bar. Um, how that would go down. Would people have the same reaction to how people are, you know, getting turned away from queer bars or would it be understandable? Okay, cool. This Because I think pubs in general, traditional pubs are like that anyway, right? If the landlady... Or the people that own it, the landlords and stuff, are, you know, incredibly Caucasian. The vibe in it will be incredibly Caucasian. So it's not that big of a, it's not that different really. Um, but I don't know. It's not like they serve crackers in there and shit. Do you know what I mean? It's not that, it's not that, it's not that fucking um, crass. But I wonder if there'll be the same reaction. But you know, I guess I'll have to learn when I fucking finally open it. Um, Zinger's coming very soon. Zinger's coming very soon definitely want that but i think some people need to understand that there is a difference between being an ally and somebody who just on uh, during gay pride does a rainbow on their cheek mm. and then runs around getting drunk with oh. a load of gay guys because they're so much fun <laughs> yeah same could be said for carnival isn't it there's, there's more to fucking being black than fucking dutty whining some big backy big batty girl at a fucking carnival isn't it right hey there's more to being black than drinking a magnum or fucking eating watermelon and fucking fried chicken you motherfuckers out there hey whoever's out there if you're eating fried chicken right now put it down if you're eating fried chicken right now put it down and yeah. people say like no if you say yeah you are aware that we are queer but yeah i'm okay with it i'm okay with queers like yeah. it's a it's a way or being an ally and know about the community uh, and and also actually in the community, uh, then people just uh, yeah say are okay with queers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's that's a bit of the difference. Okay with yeah. queer because yeah, you know a queer or like uh, yeah, you you think it's fun. As a girl, they really like to be in a queer bar because there's no guy hating on you. Yeah, that's yeah. a different. Uh, I wonder who's the most toxic. I would love to ask a queer person or a gay person who who's more toxic the girls who are like the straight girls who are like overly oh my god you're so fabulous or this sort of ex extravagant excessive nonsense or the lads who like overly ask you questions also who's the top who's the bottom i wonder who's the most annoying to like a group of like people within that community who's more annoying the overly straight group of girls or the overly straight group of guys what's the most annoying group to kind of have to endure or to put up with if i had to guess i probably said the girls because girls are overly familiar right with gay guys and with lesbians they're going to be touching you way more they're going to be wearing more in your in your space they're going to be feeling your boobs to hair touching your makeup and shit asking you loads of invasive questions whereas i think the lads will be maybe annoying loitering around and asking questions too but they won't be as tansy probably they won't violate your personal space probably they might say some crash shit and say some stuff that might make you feel away but at least they won't personally violate you <laughs> you know what i mean whereas a girl would you know what I mean, lift up your top, do this sort of nonsense, like, what the fuck are you doing? Just going crazy straight, girl. So maybe I think the, you know, the Liverpool Street um, gaggle of geese women will definitely be the more annoying, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, that's, a different, that's not an ally. An yeah. ally is you understand the queer community, you stand up for the queer community, you speak out. Like, it has to, it has to be, you have to be a bit activistic. Yeah, and I think another exact prime example of that is during Pride last year on uh, the Saturday, there was a girl uh, attacked by an uh, Uber driver. And a few days later on the Wednesday, there were uh, the Pride was on Saturday, on the Wednesday there was a protest about this. Mm. Where were all of those people that were running around the city thinking it was all fun and getting drunk with us? Mm -hmm. That was the moment you needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that was that is actually why we were doing this. This is that's the truth, though. You know what I mean? That is the actual truth. Where are you? Are you only there during Gay Pride when they're fucking handing out free fucking rainbow flags and shit, 
or are you actually protesting the you know the the assault or the, the unfortunate passing of somebody in the community especially you know when it's a homophobic type of attack or something whatever it may be that's the real mark of an ally like where are you are you actually 10 toes down or are you only here when it's party time and when it's time to have a line mm. why pride exists it was it began as a riot and it was to fight for rights and everything that we now have today and uh, still have to keep fighting for. Even on Pride, this poor girl got attacked in a cab. And yeah, I think that was really kind of a little bit when we were at the Homer Monument um, for the protest on the Wednesday, I was really looked around me like, where where are all the allies now? Mm -hmm. This is this is something that matters. Mm -hmm. This is not just a party. Yeah, and th that's why I think I think that if people are going to be that ally, they either need to be with you on the moments that count, not just the moments that are just fun to be around, and they need to be contributing something to this uh, to this community. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed, 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 agreed. Very well eloquently put, to be honest. And to be fair, that little clip, I watched the whole interview anyway. It definitely opened up my eyes because, you know, I, I think I see myself as a pretty decent ally. But there's definitely parts um, of my approach, my understanding, my just presence that I still need to kind of be, you know, clued up on and fix up certain bits and pieces. So it was great to hear from them um, in terms of kind of opening up my side of things from the other side of things, not opening up my eyes from the other side in terms of how they go about it, their views and how I can best navigate those spaces. But in general, I think that video, that interview should give you a good understanding and a good primer as to what you could expect for Tillatech when it does eventually open. Those are the people behind it. That's how seriously they take their clubs. That's how seriously they take their bars that's how seriously they take their philosophy behind what they're doing what they open so i'm really curious to see what happens when it opens and what it looks like so far no idea on the pictures and what it's going to end up looking like on the instagram i just checked their tag section here on the instagram page actually um there's no real indication on what we can see when it does eventually open interior wise there'll probably be no no photo policy anyway like most good places there'll be no photos available so so far we've got these two pictures um black floor i guess the, the floors have been painted white so maybe there's some studio spaces there because i don't think they're going to have a white floor for a club that won't, that won't make any sense so maybe these painting pictures are mostly to do with it being redone for the studio so no idea on the theme the colors and shit what we can expect um in terms of what it's going to look like on the inside how they're going to change it i wasn't really aware of what the school would look like on the inside anyway to be completely fair so it's all going to be new to me when it does eventually open up but i'm really eager to go um, flights to amsterdam aren't that expensive and the dates are pretty decent as well um april 12th um 13th and 14th going forward so i'm eager to see wagwan when it does eventually open eager to see wagwan when it does eventually open so big up to the tech lineup looks fucking sick can't wait to see it when it opens cannot wait to see it when it fucking does open it's gonna be fun moving on um we have to talk about um Berghain, obviously we have to in it right it's fucking standard me having to fucking talk about Bergheim on this fucking lovely podcast of mine because they have put out the what you call it lineup for may and it's pretty decent i'm not gonna lie there's one particular day that everyone's kind of creaming themselves over um i do like that they do go out of their way to always i feel like with Bergheim, they go out of their way to kind of have i think you know april and march were two crazy good months in terms of lineups it was so fucking good just this past weekend was obviously the or just this past week month was obviously the sylvester as well in april but i think all the months have been pretty sick and um, march especially was really fucking stacked loads of great lineups you got get up to girls united you got polari night um yeah you got the ham hammer nights as well that was also good people spec a lot of good about that you had the snack club you had the um oster um, which is the easter event that happened at the end of march and then of course april you've got some banging events also lined up as well um limousine dream happening as well there uh you got the artello bar habka returning back with slow motion drag cleaning night you got reef night also happening which would be fucking sick so loads of great nights but then they've also released um the lineup for may and the may event looks good but again it's kind of it's a bit of a heads one i like that again that like they had two banging nut months and then they kind of slow it down again for may maybe ramp up again for june or maybe not because june might be festival season but regardless um the one that really stands out to me date wise is definitely towards the end 
on the 20 was it 20th right so on the weekend of the 25th 4th you got a bite night happening um you got filmmaker playing um you got new uh new new romancer playing pablo bozi i'm a big fan of the hacker so amazing um you know fucking tunes there to be had as well so i'm definitely looking forward to that one and obviously you've got soft crash as well for your um what's your parish smith not for your parish and then of course you got the regular club night as well happening on the saturday 25th of may which is a really good lineup here ben sims big up uk legend ben sims stand up uh bestie hero also playing against playing jacko jacko and um, the legend that is luke slater also on that 25th which i'm also i'm really considering booking a ticket to go to this one um panorama bar you got dinky long time no see dinky actually that's a real throwback john talibut playing mike star house legend nicola and vlada also playing so a really good balanced lineup there happening um for the friday and the saturday as well so definitely check that out if you're that way inclined and then other dates here things to check out i guess the soul 10 5 night here is pretty good blue hour uh blue blue hour sorry back to back with philippa pasho that'll be pretty decent to check out um there's a laundrette night happening here um i think laundrette is that isn't it the night that thing he does with um in israel i'm sure right roy perez so roy perez is playing partok um kilopatra jones grace sands also playing there the following the following day this is a really good lineup actually on the 5th of may answer code request luke hess nick hopner pariah steffi sick lineup paramount bar you got okay williams radio slave rosses simon caldwell that's a really fucking good that's a, actually that's a bit of a sleeper one there fifth of fifth of may so definitely if you're thinking of dates to go to i definitely would keep a note on that one um what else do i like on here some of the other nights during the week are actually quite good you've got Eli escobar playing on the laboratory that's gonna be fucking good manpower and bout hmm interesting revolting Look at the flyer as well. Absolutely lovely. Love that. Eli Escobar, Lady Monix, Manpower, and N Balkama, which is N Balkama is definitely an underrated, unofficial resident resident of fucking Berghain in general. And Laboratory is legitimately one of my favorite um rooms in fucking Berghain. It doesn't get used enough because obviously you use it for the main events, but if you haven't been in there, I really recommend you check it out. Um then the 50 this one is a really good one too. Oh, actually, no, Jacket Body Night. Um, on Friday, the tenth of May, you got Cody Curry, Desiree, and of course Honey Dijon. Um, and in the following day, you got Adil, uh, Blasher, and Alat playing. Who have they've actually been smashing it with the gigs they're everywhere. I check on Instagram; they're always popping up all over the place. So big up them. Um, you got Maron also playing. Another appearance from Maron. Big up Maron. Um, Yonti also playing there. Yonti, I think, is meant to be um. Roy Perez's partner, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Ace um Panorama, you got Ace Mo playing, Aurora Halal, Boris is also there. So it, this is another good one. Another good lineup is eleventh. This is a really good stacked one as well. You got Boris, Massiano, uh Massimiliano and um, Pellegrano playing there, Ryan Elliott, who I'm also a big fan of. Yeah, really good one as well. Um and then another one that stuck out was this one as well here, actually. Um, which is the eighteenth of May. You got Amaral, Ben Clock, DJ Red, Norman Nodge, Jamie Free Two Six in, in playing in Parama Bar or Gazon, Paramita, who I love, said if S D is also amazing. Soundstream, legend Soundstream playing as well there on fucking eighteen. So yeah, one for the heads. No a lot a lot of big blockbuster names. On the Thursday, got October playing there. So, but again, if you're that way inclined, I think this will be. I've always said, I think personally for me, the months after a special event are always the best. So they just had the fucking Sylvester happening. I think this event, or you know, the April is also kind of stacked. I usually think the May or the ones that are a bit quieter are usually a better indication or you better illustration of what Bergan's about as a club so you're going to either love it or hate it but it's probably best to go outside of a special event number one the queues won't be as long it won't be as busy um it'll be quite unquote easier to get in sometimes because these are like for the heads events and not like big names so you won't have a lot of tons of tourists flying all over the place coming to attend them it'll be a lot of quote unquote regulars and locals um and again like i said it'll be a better way to kind of get an understanding of whether or not you like the place or not because it's going to be just like a regular club night as opposed to a regular you know club night you know event month whatever as opposed to like a crazy 
let's go wild project x type of affair when it's a special event and there's queues because like i said you know i've been to bergheim before you know regrettably so and ashamedly so where i've queued outside for four hours during a special event sick don't get me wrong special events are really good i think for tourists because you get a chance to see a ton of people um you know playing all at once and you know you get loads of bang for your money bang for buck bang for your money wherever because you get to see a lot of time people like the recent one in october no, so the recent Easter one at the end of March, right? Look at that lineup. You've got Jimmy Jules, AIM, um, back to back with AIM, you know, DJ Russ, Steffi, Holographic, um, you know, Palms Tracks, Last Eye, Taylor Johnson playing, LOL Snake, Honey Dijon, like loads of people. So for the tourists, these special events are good, but they're really busy. You know, that's the only problem. So you have to queue a lot of really long, loads of people queue cutting, the toilet queues inside are fucking crazy. It can be a bit nuts, but it's a good chance to see it really, you know, at its full turn up self. But personally, I prefer the much quieter months because they're easier to get in number one. And also it's just a nicer vibe because it's just, and it's a more diverse crowd, different ages and shit. It's not just all young techno cool freak kids in there. I personally like them. It's a bit quiet. So May's looking good. I've got my eye personally on the 25th and 24th and 25th so if you don't see me for that weekend streaming you know where i'm gonna be at if you don't see me for that weekend streaming you know where i'm gonna be at you know it don't cry don't complain you know the vibes you know the blood clot freaking vibes okay moving on moving on from that one we have to talk about this I don't understand why this Bode and Nike collection is so fucking gay looking <laughs> in the most non-rude way possible. Like, why does it look like this? Why did why did the clothes look so frilly? Why is there no like I don't know? Why is it why does it look like this? Especially when you think about the collections aren't this wishy washy. So Bode came together with Nike. They put together some shoes, which I which I actually like. I love the shoes. I'm not gonna lie. I would definitely fucking wear the shoes. The shoes look super, super hard. Um, they kind of remind me a little bit of the Mars Yards from Tom Sachs back, that back in the day, a little bit. So it's a retail image of the Nike Astro Grabber um, shoe down in collaboration with Bode. Um, some people are suggesting that they're the Samba Killer or something. I don't think that's the truth, personally, for me. Um, but I do like the look of them. you got like an all-white, I guess you got an off-white cream type of upper there um, with, a, oh, with a white midsole. Which so the white midsole and the white outer, which obviously looks you know similar to what you'd imagine a Tom Sachs Mars Yards look like. Um, there's no real discernible toe box. It's all kind of one piece around the front. Um, mesh upper, which probably might be a bit wild for myself with my big fat toes and feet. You know, you might have some of your knuckles sticking out here unless you get the correct size, which I'm usually not the most knowledgeable with. I always like buying the shoes a bit smaller and take out the insoles, so that might be a bit of a mad one. But they do look pretty cool. And they also come with these little accoutrements that you put on the laces, these little um, crabs and lobsters and shit, Jordan Peterson style, right? On the laces. And also they got the bowed um, insignia on there on the tongue. So it's quite a, quite, quite a cool little sneaker, to be fair quite similar to like a field general and shit but it's not it's called an astro grabber so i guess it's meant to be like a baseball shoe or something i don't know um the pair in black comes with these little is it like a pearl drop no it's like a it looks like a it looks like an envelope like a like an old school kettlebell it's like a round little metal ball on the laces there and it's obviously in all leather so it's up to you you either get the all black in this all leather style which is really plain leather no tumble or anything with the off-white swoosh or you get the cream pair with the mesh all over it i, I like the hill counter actually the hill counter suede i love that this is a nice little hit i'm a big fan of this whenever people do monochromatic shoes it's just all black and all white i love when you just switch the panels so you have like one part suede one part mesh one part you know tumbled leather but it's all black. I quite like that. I'm not going to lie. I think it looks pretty cool because it picks up the light differently. And when you wear them, they're kind of wearing a bit different. But these leather, this these ones, I'm not going to lie. The leather and the black pair doesn't look great. They look like they might crease like fuck, especially around the front. These look like they might crease really badly. And again, creasing is all good, but you don't want your brand new shoes that are going to cost you $150 to look like they've been fucking, you know, run through at fucking Glastonbury. Do you know what I mean? I don't want that. But they do look pretty nice. I do actually like them. I'm not going to lie. The off-white laces are quite nice as well, but definitely the creams are definitely the best one. This cream colorway is just stupendous. I'd wear the fuck out of that shoe. So you see a model wearing them here. So they look way more pointy around here, but the model actually makes them look flatter. So they don't, they don't look as like, 
pointy and narrow at the front as they do on the retail picture. So maybe they might end up looking like that. So I actually like the look at them. They look pretty cool. Like the look, I'll definitely keep an eye out for them. Is there a release date here? Um, it's still uncertain. Yeah, so no, no release date so far. But the Vogue cover, the Vogue um, story here features some of the clothing in collaboration with the Nike stuff. The clothing just looks so lame. Like, what, what the fuck is this? Like, what is that? What is that jersey? What is that top? What are those shorts? Like, why does it look like this? Especially when the actual, like, a photo of the designer's dad in the football. Yeah, look at this designer's dad wearing a football jersey, right? Number seven. Look how badass he looks there. And then you've got this really limp-wristed shit here at the top. Why is it like that? Like, I don't get why it looks so wafty. Like, why is... Why is the jersey like leaning off of one shoulder? Like, why is it? Why is it all like very twink coded? But the dad's obviously a bit of a Chad, a bit of a bro. But we got all this like Timothy Chamelay football wear. It's so odd. I would have preferred it if it looked a bit more bad. I was like this, to be completely honest, a bit more brutish. But it doesn't. It was a little bit, you know, a little bit lame, a little bit limp wristed, a little bit lollipop, lollipopish. Like these these thermals under the shorts, like what the fuck is this? Horrendous. The only thing that's good is probably the batting gloves, but I don't know if they're part of the collection. The batting gloves look quite cool, right? I think they're batting gloves, I'm assuming. Right? Batting gloves, catching mitts, I'm not too sure. Um this top here, Apache cod, like with the tur like this V neck top with the turtleneck underneath, no thank you. These fucking African uncle Nike short Nike trousers, no thank you. Maybe these, I'd wear the pop socks this girl's got on, look quite cool. They might look quite cool, but I wouldn't wear them with these shoes, right? Because this is giving apartheid or something, isn't it? This is giving fucking freedom fire. I'm not really on this. Um, the shorts are okay. The top, no thank you. Again, like, what is this stuff like? Why does it look so ugly? Why is the dad uses inspiration in this amazing old school vintage picture of him in the 70s? And then you got all this very wishy washy stuff. The thermals, no. Maybe the socks, again, are pretty nice here. That top is maybe a little bit okay. Take off the strings, but I guess the strings is part of it, maybe. That might work. But again, it's a, it's a cropped top, isn't it? It's a cropped jersey top with an elasticated, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not with that, to be honest, in the slightest. So, again, I don't know why it looks like this. It looks really fucking awful. Unfortunately so. The shoes are very much worth your time, I think. The bow and Nike Astro Grabbers, but I think the clothing could get thrown in the bin for me. It's absolutely horrendous, in my personal opinion. Is there a release date? Let's see if they said anything about a release date for the shoes. Release date? Nope, we don't know. Cool. No release date. Brilliant. We don't know about the release date. So I guess, you know, I guess it's no nothing nothing lost there. Nothing has been lost there. We don't know the date. We don't know the blood clot date. What an amazing time to be alive. What an amazing time to be alive. you got to love it, innit? You have to fucking love it. Mo Next on the list here, we got this courtesy of Hype Never Dies regarding a closer look at the cactus plant flea market Nike Air Force One lows in four different colorways. you got black, purple, white, and this snot green absolutely incredible i love these man they're so simple yet so good um classic air force one lows in really nice leather material and you've got this ad addition of the air and then you've got the what do you call it what's it at, at the side it says the air on one side and it's got a 3m piping on the outside so when obviously the flash goes off you got that nice little hit on the outside and then so one side has got air i don't think i don't know what it says on the other side was it said soup something? I don't know. Let me see the other picture. It says air on something. I don't know what the other side is. But regardless, really cool design with the air written on the other side. I really want a pair. The leather looks amazing. As you can see there from the crease, this is a good quality leather. Um, and then you've also got these thick um, laces as well to kind of give them a bit of character as well. So you've got regular laces, I think, tied in there. Regular laces here and also thick ones. So you see the thick ones here on the purple and also you see the normal ones here on the green and the black. So I'd wear every single color, to be fair. I'm, I'm not even going to choose one. If I had to choose one colorway to go for, I had to gun to head. I might go for the purples just because it's such a rare color to get in an Air Force One. Do you know what I mean? Like, but I'd wear the, I'd wear the fuck out of the all blacks and the all whites and the all greens. But if you had to choose one color, maybe the purple, because when else are you going to get an all purple Air Force One like that? What else are you going to get that? Do you know what I mean? They look fucking incredible. They look so good. So, so, so good. Again, bit normie, bit basic. I understand. 
you know when you see stuff like this the first thing you think about is vlone and guys that wear really distressed light denim jeans and shit i understand you know i get it but i really love these i'm not gonna lie there's something about these that i fucking love and i'd wear the fuck out of them no date so far on release i don't think so i haven't seen any release date on these so far but they look fucking sick i'd wear the fuck out of these i really would i really want a pair badly i'd wear all four but buying all four on retail would be like what five bills six bills um then on resale probably be way more but yeah I'd, I'd be curious to try to try my luck and see if i can get a pair on retail or something and again maybe it's a purples or the greens but i'd wear all of them the first thing i do my air force ones i'm sure if you guys do the same thing i take off the little lace jaw i hate this lace jaw thing the first thing i do when i get air force one lows is i throw away this lace jaw i go straight in the bin and then you relace them of course but yeah big up cactus plant flea market another great collaboration nice and simple i love it i fucking love it okay i fucking love it i don't care what you say i absolutely love it i really fucking do so to end it to end it and relating back to the title of the pod or the pod horny settings what do we think about yay is yay really horny or do we think they really do enjoy this style of dressing that they seem to adopt for each other where you know yeah obviously encourages his wife to wear these sort of garments she clearly likes to wear them because we've seen pictures of bianca sensori before she was with yay you know experimenting and dressing up and wearing some really cool amazing extravagant designs so clearly she loves to be scantily dressed but i'm wondering because when i see this picture the latest one of them where yay has got this amazing all black outfit on and bianca sensori is wearing this crazy see-through basically seafood dress that kind of looks like a condom like it's been cut off on both ends and she's also wearing these amazing seafood socks that look really cool um with some heels um outside with her bare boobies out and nani out and shit i wonder if this is like what you would imagine would be a swingers couple like if you've ever been out and approached by like a couple like hey we want to take you back to our room and something usually one person in the couple is like usually dressed overtly sexual you know what i mean overtly so whether it's the woman that's got a fucking butt plug on with a fucking light on it that you can see for a skirt or the guy's wearing or the guy's got nipple piercings or something there's usually something about them that you can tell okay or the or, or one of them's wearing a thumb ring right guys who wear thumb rings are definitely horny right always fucking ready to go if you've got a thumb ring you're definitely fucking horny or if you've got one of those beards where you leave the hair underneath your lip you leave the hair underneath your lip type of thing and you cut everything off, you're definitely a horny guy. So I wonder if this is hints of them being horny or of them just like wanting to wear things completely different to what... Because the thing about Bianca Sensori's style, which I really like, no one else looks like her outside now. Maybe the only thing I can think of that's close to Bianca Sensori's personal sense of style is Lotto Volkova, right? The former stylist of uh, Balenciaga, who's now styling um, Miu Miu, if I'm not mistaken. Last time I checked, I think Volta, Lotta Volkova is um, styling at Miu Miu, but Lotta Volkova's style reminds me a lot of how Bianca Sensori dresses, right? It's very, I wouldn't say, would say kitschy, whatever the vibe is, you know what I'm talking about, right? If you know what she dresses like, but how Lotta Volkova used to dress or dress is reminds me a lot of fucking Bianca Sensori. Um, so I wonder if that was a style inspiration for what they're going for, or if it's a completely different thing and it has nothing to do with fucking you know horniness levels and it's just them wanting to express themselves and be fucking the best version of themselves outside i'm not really too sure but whenever i look at bianca sensori i'm always kind of she kind of reminds me of how lotto used to dress like with the kitten heels and the tights and the wild combinations up above and shit um like you know like a lot like you could you could, again maybe the, the shirt's too much of a covering but you could definitely see you know kanye's wife wearing something like this with the oversized shirt the the, the short skirt and shit the toes out with the heels it kind of looks a little bit like something that you know bianca sensori would wear herself even this shirt even this outfit there as well another one and of course there's probably going to be some more too if we keep fucking scrolling here we'll probably see some more this is probably Miu Miu styling as well so i don't know i'm i, I I'm I'm still I'm still on the fence. I'm not really too sure what the if it is a sign that they're both incredibly fucking horny all the time and Kanye just loves seeing her his wife's massive tits in his face all the fucking time or if it's just them 
vibing and just styling on fucking motherfuckers and reminding people, hey, we are the most stylish couple out here on these streets. Don't fucking play with us. I wonder. I'm really curious because that is a crazy outfit. Because I already said, like, it's already a big challenge for dudes. It's something you have to kind of get used to and you only get used to it by dating more people. But it's always a challenge when you hook up with your first conventionally hot person as a guy because you have to deal with that attention they're going to get when you're out, right? Regular guy is just going to look and turn and say, oh shit, your girl's got a massive ass. I mean, and just whatever, right? Guys are going to be guys. So you have to learn how to navigate that field. It's very hard to do, especially if you're a dude that's very possessive and stuff to kind of handle that kind of stuff, which is, you know, it is what it is. But over time, you learn to just get over it. It's not a big deal. People are allowed to look. As long as they don't touch or be rude, it's all well and good. But, but with this level, this is another level. She's out with her full fucking... Mummy milk is out, batty out, pussy out. It's like, God damn, son. How do you handle that one then? You know, like <laughs> that must be a hard one. It's even more so for her, because I remember one time when I was in Ber Berghain, I went to Berghain this one time, right? And I think I was just too high or something. I, I don't even know what I was doing. I was just standing in Berghain main floor and I was at the back where there's like a railing, if you know where, you know, next to the stairs. And I was just like staring it out into the distance, you know, probably rolling on some E. And I, I was just staring out, I wasn't even looking at anything. But every time the light would flash next to the front, there'd be this girl that was topless there that would just like catch my eye. But I wasn't looking at her, I was looking in the direction where the light was. But then I guess at one time, our eyes caught each other and she immediately felt self-conscious when she saw me. Because it looked like I was staring at her straight away. But I wasn't. I was just staring in the general direction. And I remember having to like turn my head away and be like, okay, cool. Do your thing. And then obviously she got more comfortable and kind of did her thing. But it's probably one of those unavoidable things. If you're a woman and you've got big tits and they happen to be out in any way, whether it's cleavage or whether your nipples are showing in your, under your shirt, you must be able to tell, even with your back turned to the person, you can probably feel a man's eyes burning through the back of your fucking spine. So how much more when you're a woman like this and you've got this sheer dress on? That must be a what? So say, say what you want about how, oh, how's Kanye deal with it? How does she deal with it? Like all that unwanted, again, it's different because they're celebrities. They pull up in a fucking, you know, in a fucking Hummer. They pull up in a Porsche and duck out. I get it. But you still have to be, you know, around people. So you have to walk down the street to the cinema. You still have to walk up the, around the corner to the restaurant. You still have to get out of the car. I mean, it's a bit, it's a lot. So I, I salute the bravery. I'm not going to lie. I love the bravery of people who get dressed up every day like they're going to a fucking fashion week. I think that's also incredible. And I also salute the bravery of women like this who are like, I'm stepping out. And it's obviously comfortable because you're with your man, fair. But I'm stepping out like this. Like, look at me wherever you want, but this is what I'm about. Do you know what I mean? This is my personal sense of style. This is how I feel the most chic, the most together, the most sexy, whatever it may be. Um, but I rate it. I'm not going to lie. I, rate, I fucking love it. Because I don't even know what that material is. It looks a bit shiny-ish. It looks almost like... It looks almost silkish in a way, like translucent or transparent silk. I don't know what kind of material it is, but whatever material it is, like everything is fucking showing. Everything. God damn. And the socks as well. But yeah. And I also like how Kanye kind of compliments her by just wearing plain black. You know what I mean? He lets her be the loud one. And this goes back to my thesis. I've always said, oh, look, pussy out. Yeah. This goes back to my thesis. I've always said that I think fashion is always for women and style is for men. So men should have style, women should be into fashion because fashion's fleeting and trend-based. And I don't think guys can do that kind of trendy, fashion-y type of dressing well. I think guys do style well, whether it's like wearing a nice leather jacket with a nice pair of jeans or a nice pair of boots. Do you know what I mean? And just kind of iterating that same style throughout the years and kind of refining it but the fashion thing it just doesn't work with us so that's why i think as a compliment as a guy the great way to kind of compliment your partner is to allow your woman to go crazy and do whatever right and then you just kind of you know hold it down with a nice suit a nice kind of you know he's got this nice oversized black look going on and it actually compliments the other person better as well i think so personally and also you know kanye's the artist isn't it so he all his creativity should go into his art and then he should save his personal dress sense as a uniform just to kind of be basic, you know? I think that's a personal, probably the best way to go about it. And obviously Bianca Sensori more so is, you know, she's basically her artwork or her, her canvas is her body. So it makes sense why her 
dress sense is a little bit more her sense personal sense of style is a bit more out there because why the fuck not so yeah i'm for it i'm for it i love it um i'm not too sure if it's horny times it might be horny times if it is you know what i mean would people take it up would, would people beat kanye to beat her <laughs> if horny times involved kanye having to sit in a room watching you clap his wife's cheeks like would you be down I'm not too sure, man. He's my hero. I can't do that to him, man. I love him too much. I have to turn down the offer. I'd have to turn down the fucking offer. Big up. Yay. Big up, my nigga. Yay. Okay. That has been the Exxon Zinger Show, episode number, what was it? Six, seven, six, three. Siete, seis, tres. Right? Siete, seis, tres in Espanol. So big up everybody that's joined me. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for hanging out. It's been a pleasure. Never a fucking chore. It's been a pleasure. Never a fucking chore. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. If you're watching on the stream live, make sure you're liking it before you leave as well. I'm going to quickly go through my alerts to see if anybody um, sent anything so I can shout you out because I turned off all the TTS for now because I went to rant and check my shit. Um, big up NJ Ranger here for sending us super chat he said earlier classic look clout goggles and you're doing real deal men's advice in rare form tonight big boss let this motherfucker have it yeah big up nj ranger appreciate you brother thank you for hanging out my friend and we've also got one here from a elmi who says tapping in bean and cheese gang exactly yeah big up the bean and cheese gang big up nj ranger big up a elmi um worry not my friends random show recipients you will see random show in a few hours i'll do that later so if you want a random show i'll be doing that in a few hours um when i finish editing and clipping and put, uploading this pod so that'll be in a few hours so definitely um you know stay tuned for that one but for those of you who've been tuning into the excellent zinger show i appreciate you so much thank you for tuning in um if you listen to the audio pod you will hear my tune of the day playing underneath my voice at the moment and obviously my tune of the day is definitely going to be the album that I recommended, the album that I think might be album of the year for me, it's Fabiana Palladino. It's going to be the track called Can You Look in the Mirror. It's fucking fantastic. That's going to be my fucking outro track. So definitely I'll be playing that in the background for those of you who are listening. 